Good evening. Welcome to the June 6th regular board meeting. Um, can we please stand for the pledge now? Thank you. Jan, would you like to lead us in the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Oh, sick. No. <laughs> I thought that was everything. We were singing again now. It was great, though. <laughs> All right, so the board has convened at 5 p.m. today to move into executive session. Um, may I have a motion to move into executive session for the following reasons? To discuss the employment history of a particular individual, contract negotiations pursuant to Article 14 of the Civil Service Law, and the proposed sale of real property the value of would be substantially affected should it be discussed in public. I'll make a motion to do what you said. Okay. I'll second, second to do what you right. said. Thank you. All, All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. No one opposed. We are going to move to executive session. Thank you. We'll be back by <laughs> 6. The latest. So we've already started our meeting and said the pledge, so I'd like to um, turn it over to Mr. Bystrack to recognize, who will recognize our 2023 retirees. Absolutely. Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Uh, we moved our board meeting into the gymnasium. I think it's a good thing we did that right now, considering the number of people that are in the audience. So I do appreciate everybody coming out tonight to celebrate. We've got a lot of celebrating to do tonight. Uh, we've got some retirees, like a significant number of retirees. We have some students that have graduated from our OSEP program. Uh, we're also going to be recognizing some of our departing board members and wel welcoming in a couple other ones that, have just, uh, that are uh, just newly elected. So uh, lots of good things going on tonight. So... Uh, Last year we did this up on the stage where everybody came and we got a little crowded on the stage and then people were disappearing and getting lost making their way up to the stage. So this year what we're going to do is first we're going to start off with our, uh, our OSEP students, so our students that gra are graduating here. We're going to welcome up our teachers and I'm going to have Mrs. Wright um, uh, come on up. Forgive me. Um, I apologize. Nope, we're hitting the retirees first. I Forgive me, okay? I turned my page over. So first, we're going to recognize our retirees. Uh, so this is actually one of my favorite meetings of the year because I get to read the name of the retiree, how many years they've been in the district, and then we get to total it up at the end, how many years of service that we had to the district. So um, what we are going to do with our retirees, though, uh, is we're going to have them kind of line up kind of on a curve around the wall up here, kind of ending right around where that flag is. Um, Dr. Cervoni, can I impose upon you to come on up here and just kind of welcome them as they come on up over here? So when I call your name, if you're here, uh, please come on up to the front here. We're going to get everybody, all retirees, all here together. Uh, and then we're going to go ahead and we'll say where they're uh, coming from and how many years they've been with us. All right. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. So Ms. Lotza is asking if they can go. So I guess we'd have you come up to see Ms. Lotza, get your certificate, and then come through here. Please watch the cords. So... All right, and this is going to, we're going to actually, the order of operations here basically starts off with people that have, uh, maybe the, the newest folks to the district, right up to the most senior folks to the district, okay? Uh, so we're going to start off with uh, one of our security officers who's been with us for a year, uh, Robert uh, Michienzi. Is Robert here today? Okay, I'm going to say let's get a clap. I don't care if they're here or not, folks, okay? <laughs> We have somebody from our transportation department, bus driver Becky Safe, who's been with us for 4.7 years. Is Becky here? Uh, we have a teacher aide from West Senior, Sue Bodkin, who's been with us for 5.9 years. Is Sue here? Uh, bus driver Lynn Burgess of our transportation department for the past 7.1 years. We have a grounds worker, uh, James Whalen Jr., 8.6 years. A bus attendant who's been with us for 13.9 years, Debbie Storr. Is Debbie here? We 
we have a clerk typist, Catherine McGuire, uh, out of East Middle School, 14.7 years. <laughs> Another bus attendant uh, who's been with us for 14.8 years, uh, uh, Deborah Amico. Is Deborah here? <laughs> Come on up, Deborah. You can't just, you know, you're here, you're coming up. <laughs> We have one of our food service helpers out of West Senior who's been in the district for 15.5 years. Uh, that would be Catherine Pat Gary. All right, we have one of, uh, another one of our school lunch monitors from Clinton Street Elementary, 15.6 years. Sue Saika, is Sue here? From West Senior, one of our clerk typists, uh, Karen Kapusinski, but if you know her real well, it's Karen Kapp. She's been with us for 15.9 years. Uh, Kathy Ryan, a teacher aide here from West Elementary, 16.2 years. have Karen Lester, a teacher from East Senior, 17.9 years. Our head of security, uh, Dave Urbanic, who's been with us for 18.7 years. We have one of our clerk typists, Patricia Patty Hartman, who has been with us at district office for 18.8 .8 years. <laughs> All right, we have one of our teachers from East Senior, Colleen Dangler, 18.8 .8 years. Another one of our teachers out of East Middle School, Nancy Blazak, for 20.6 years. Congratulations. Clerk typist from West Senior, Kathy McLeod, 21.3 years. Uh, one of our bus attendants from the transportation department, uh, Doria Schlager-Gretzler, for 22.9 years. <laughs> Sally Harkelrode, uh, teacher aide from Allendale, 23.6 years. Uh, from West Senior Hall Monitor, Marlene Deserba, for 24.3 years. Teacher aide from West Middle School for 24.3 years, Pam Perry. <laughs> you know you're going to sit in a lawn chair on the first day of school over at West Middle School. your favorite person, okay? Uh, Kelly Krasuski, uh, physical therapy assistant out of East Middle for 24.4 years. We have our, uh, one of our nurses and our nurse coordinator uh, out of West Middle School, Linda Tebow, 24.9 years. East Senior Teacher for the past 25.8 years, uh, Corinne Murphy. Corinne? Congratulations. Rhonda Weisenberg, cleaner over at East Senior, 26.8 years. <laughs> T. 
teacher aide from Clinton Street Elementary, Karen Delecki, 26.8 years. Uh, we have Maria Prentice, a speech teacher from Clinton Street Elementary, 26.8 years. West Senior Teacher Diane Meany, 27.8 years. Another teacher with the same last name, Tom Meany, West Senior, 27.8 years. West Senior is well represented here tonight. Rick Sutton, West Senior Teacher, 28.6 years. Uh, Karen Dubinsky, teacher out of Clinton Street Elementary, 28.8 years. The interesting part about this all, folks, is that Jan Dalbo over here, we still haven't gotten to the amount of time that she's, she's hired every single one of these people here so far. So just putting it out there, okay? 30 plus years will do that for you. I uh, married them all. <laughs> Congratulations. We have Linda Banker, a teacher out of West Senior, 29.0 years. <laughs> Diane Clark, teacher at West Middle, 29.8 years. Janine Cole, a uh, special ed teacher here at West Elementary who may be at the Poetry Slam right now upstairs, but 29.8 years. She's upstairs scatting. Okay. Uh, Anne-Marie uh, D'Agostino, teacher at East Senior, 30.8 years. Barb Regal, nurse out of East Senior, 30.9 years. Patricia Gallagher, teacher out of Allendale, 31.8 years. <laughs> Mari Cruikshank Gary, another one of our speech teachers over at East Middle School, 32.3 years. Lori Jean Sikowiak, clerk typist out of East Middle School, 32.3 years. Virginia Chattel, teacher at Allendale, 32.8 years. Inside joke, folks, but let's just say if you call a snow, do you get these, okay? <laughs> Bonnie Williams, teacher out of West Middle School, 32.8 years. <laughs> Don Volker, teacher at Winchester Potters, 32.8 years. Marianne Hanovan, bus driver, 33.8 uh, years. <laughs> and finally, we have Donna Wilcox, a food service helper at Winchester Potters, 37.8 years. Best part, folks, uh, total years of service to the district, 1,030.3 years. Folks, ladies and gentlemen, let's give it up.
We've got quite a bit of institutional knowledge and history right here, folks, and it can't be replaced. All I can say is we've brought on some new folks out into the district over the past few years, and I can tell you that all of these folks sitting here right now have been good mentors to some of our newer, the newer crop of uh, teachers and school-related professionals that we have here at school. So thank you all for your many years of service and dedication to our students. Thank you. Folks, I'm sorry if you were just up here. I'm, uh, I am being scolded here. We did not do a picture. We need a picture, folks. So if everybody can come on back up. I apologize. It doesn't count. Well, I'm taking pictures. <laughs> I need to go on the stage and everybody can line up and face this stage. It's the best way to put it on you. Okay. Folks, uh, to our retirees, we do have some cake out in the hallway out there. If any retirees would like to have some cake, by all means, please help yourselves out there. Uh, we're going to keep our party rolling here, though. We have some, uh, uh, some folks from our ASEP program that uh, Mrs. Wright, who runs pretty much everything in the district, is going to be introducing. So thank you, Stephanie Wright. Thank you. Good evening. Um, I am Stephanie Wright. I'm the director for Community Ed. Um, one of the programs that we run under Community Ed is the OSEP program. OSEP stands for Alternative High School Equivalency Preparation Program. This current year, we have had 10 students graduate, um, and I've had that done with the help of four great teachers. 
I would like to say that it was because of me, but it is not because of me. I just oversee the program. So the first thing I want to do is recognize my teachers. Um, Krista Bovin could not be here this evening. She had another engagement as well as Kaylin Gresham. Um, they have been with me the last three years for Kaylin, and Krista has been with me for 12 years. But I also have Travis Starzynski. This is his first year teaching for me. Travis is also a teacher up in Clarence during the day, so he does not just do this at night. Thank you, Travis. And then also I have Don Teresa. Don has been with me since November. He is also a teacher at Depew during the day. Out of our 10 students, I only have two here tonight. Um, I will read all of their names and I'll leave the two that are here to come up at the end. I have Ashaya Collins, who is a West grad. She will be going into culinary. I have Thaddeus Hector. He is an East grad. We have Marissa Ludwig. She um, is a West grad. And she actually is fostering a lot of kittens right now. Um, that is her passion, is fostering animals, and she wants to get into animal therapy. Um, I have Zachary Pikasinski, Alexis Pufal, who is working full-time for Niagara uh, Produce. And I have Joseph Richter, Andrew, and John Waranecki as well. But tonight I have with me Timothy Covell. I would like Timothy Covell to come up, please. He's extremely nervous, so I told him I would be fast. Timothy came um, after Christmas. He has been with us a few months. He is a really, really hard worker. And because of that, you have earned your GED. So congratulations. I also have Isabella Riggs here with me tonight. Isabella is from East. Come on up, sweetheart. I have never seen a girl more determined in what she wants. She came the first night, she says, this is what I'm going to do, and I'm going to get it done. And she got it done really fast in two months. So congratulations. I know that you've been uh, putting applications out. She is for hire. Okay, she is looking for a job. She's ready to start. <laughs> so um, congratulations, sweetheart. <laughs> These are my 2023 grads. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone that was really sweet and emotional <laughs> thank you all for coming um, at this time I actually mr. vice would you like to give us a bright uh, superintendent's report sure sure thank you I'll be brief folks I know there's a lot going on tonight so uh, first again just congratulations to our retirees and to our OSEP grads uh, quite an accomplishment for both so and it's honestly it's kind of the uh, the how and then the end product right here you saw before you tonight so uh, congratulations to everyone I also, I know we kind of talked a little bit about this last, uh, the last board meeting, but I just want to say one more time uh, thanks to Jody and Diane and Jan for their years of service to the district. 
Um, you know, we kind of did this twice, but I just have to say that, you know, honestly, it's, in case you don't know this in the audience, folks, uh, you don't get paid to be on a school board. You dedicate your time. You devote your, you know, a lot of countless hours, more than you see that just here. There's quite a bit that goes into it. So just want to thank you all, all three of you. Diane couldn't be here right now, but all three uh, for their service. Uh, and just again to welcome to Sarah and Laura and Trek, who also is doing other things right now, too. Couldn't be here, but just to welcome to everybody uh, for being here. So. It has been my great privilege, yeah. my great privilege to serve the district, so thank you. You hired a whole gym full of people here, apparently. I hired them all but <laughs> one or two, I guess. <laughs> so. um, just a couple of things here, folks. Uh, there's a few other good things going on tonight, too. We have some more appointments, folks that are you know coming new to the district. It's kind of an exciting time of the year in that regard. Uh, we have some folks getting tenure or permanent status. That's exciting as well. Um, you know, I just want to take, you know, just this moment here, because we're kind of winding down. This is the last uh, board meeting before the end of the school year. I just want to thank all the members of our school community, all of our staff and our families, just for a great school year. Honestly, coming out of COVID, you know, we all kind of said this is, this is rough, but I feel like this year was a lot better than last year. Last year was tough. This was a good school year. I think we got a lot done. Um, it was great to just be out at events and see kids, you know, participating and engaging again. And I just, it doesn't happen uh, without the hard work and dedication of everyone. So I just want to say thank you to everyone, and uh, I hope that everyone has a happy and safe summer. So. Thank you, Mr. Bystrack. I'll just give a brief update as well. I just want to do, um, introduce Sarah, P.O.R. Zach, and Laura Sokol-Scott, who were nice enough to sit with us this board meeting. So welcome to the board, and we can't wait to get you, um, you know, we can't wait to see you again in July and get you rolling as board members. I wanted to thank Jan for... Her 32 years of service. I don't know how you thank somebody for 32 years. There aren't enough words to thank you for all that you've given to the district and, you know, just the number of years and dedication. So we will miss you. And J Jody, thank you for your three years of service and good luck in whatever you guys choose to do. Um, Diane is not here tonight, again, like Mr. Bystrick said, but we thank her for her service as well. And I just wanted to um, let everyone know I'm going to be leaving a little early tonight to. Uh, attend my son's concert at West Meadow. So Molly will be taking over. Thank you. Um, at this time we have a student rep today. Yay for student reps. Olivia is here from East Senior, right? Yes. Okay, you want to give us an update, sweetie? Yeah, thank so you. So I was given this paper, so bear with me. I did not write it, and it is a little long. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, Trojans Take Action was held. The entire student body, along with faculty and staff, um, spread out across Western New York to give back to our community. We did everything from washing police cars to assisting in closed closets and yard work in West Seneca Town Hall, Buffalo Naval Park, and many more places. We visited the total of 41 sites. We want to thank our transportation department for the rides and our custodial and food service staff for the meals when we returned. SpamFest was held and students performed eight original 10-minute plays and musicals. All of the pieces were written, directed, and performed by students. Mrs. Welgus took some time for the Rho Kappa students to spend the afternoon assisting town historian Jim Pace researching museum artifacts, writing synopses, and creating QR codes for 15 displays. Four of our students won the Niagara Frontier Industry Education Council Scholarships. It's a lot of words. Um, which, require, which required compiling a hard and electronic copy of their work showcasing skills in leadership, communication, literacy, problem solving, independent learning, interpersonal skills, and research and information management skills. Our Project Lit Club visited Clinton Elementary and assisted in kindergarten, first, third, fourth, and fifth grade classrooms. They were also working with the technology department on building and installing a little free library. We had six students qualify for track sectionals and moved on to the state championship for shot put. Our unified basketball team took first place. Our New York State bullying champions now have a road sign that anyone driving into our community can see. Our student leadership team took ideas developed, took, yep, that's the word, okay. <laughs> Would make great. students, sorry. You're doing great. Lost my spot. <laughs> they hosted a yoga class, a spirit week, and various student activities. One group took on the task of supporting our sports teams. They designed t-shirts, they had them printed, and then chose games for the student leaders to attend. Most recently, they cheered on our basketball or baseball team. 
Student Council recently named their Student and Staff Member of the Year, Allison Zapla, who could not be here tonight, and Mrs. Ocasio. Key Club hosted a book swap. Students donated books during lunches for a week, and then the next week they had the opportunity to shop for new books. Hundreds of books were swapped. Remaining books will be given to various little free libraries in the community. Mr. Katina's engineering seniors invented adaptive backyard games and then hosted the life skills technology class for an afternoon of fun games. Our students competed in a tech war and took first and second place in the video category. They were also successful on ongoing engineering mousetraps, bridge design, and cardboard canoes. Our varsity softball team were champions of section 6A2 division. Three of our students won awards at the Birchfield Show. The newest issue of the Socratic, the Socratic Scrolls is out and can be now found on the website. We have held a successful freshman orientation on June 1st due to the construction in the building. An August event would have been difficult, so we brought all of our incoming ninth graders from the middle school. They were provided with a lot of information, a tour, and spoke to many students, staff members, and teachers. Mr. Frugia took his guitar class to Springfield Arts Cafe and they participated in a concert and a master class. They were able to play with national renowned musical and recording artists Two Bird Stone and Sarah uh, Siskind. They, they were given, um, we are getting ready for our senior day, which will include a senior breakfast, a slideshow, and our elementary school walk, and of course, prom. Thank you. Thank nice you, job, Olivia. Olivia. Nice job. <laughs> <laughs> that was a mouthful. You weren't kidding. <laughs> Lots going on at East Senior. So oh, yeah. we're happy to hear that. Okay, at this time we're going to, um, we have a section set aside on our agenda to allow for public comment. So if there's anyone interested in making, um, speaking directly to the Board of Education, please step up to the podium. And um, you have three minutes state your name and address and please be respectful in your comments do not divulge any personal or confidential information the information shared will be considered and the appropriate person will contact you so um, if there's anybody who is interested in making a public comment yep okay thank you please state your name and address and you have um, three minutes Hi, my name is Christopher Giurtano. I'm a longtime West Seneca resident. I live on 42 West Kevlar Drive. Mm -hmm. um, I have two boys. Um, they both have been with East from, from day one since they were born. Um, my son Dominic is a senior at East, and my son Dante is in seventh grade and plays modified baseball. Um, the purpose of this, of me speaking today before you, is um, the need I feel in, for the kids at all, for a, a baseball diamond. Um, at East, um, on site. Um, currently, right now, they do not. They're one of the only schools in Western New York that does not have a baseball diamond on site. Um, West does, um, and it does create a sense of perception of like bias in a way. You know, like why does West have it? You know, the superintendents from West. You know, how come we don't we don't have one? You know, that's like perception of like other parents and stuff like that. And I'm pretty involved in like sports and other activities and stuff like that. And that's kind of the stuff that I'm hearing. Um, other parents have come up in the past, but they have not, like, maybe a big following, I guess, you know. Um, I've kind of heard this, and, you know, my son's now playing seventh grade. He loves ball, plays travel ball, too, for numerous years since he was little. And it's something like a, a passion for him, and I see how passionate it is, you know, with his friends and stuff like that. Um, currently, the two areas that the schools play, so the modifying team plays right at Allendale currently right now. Um, I'll be honest with you, the, the diamond is embarrassing compared to all the other diamonds that we going to, whether it's Williamsville, Sweet Home, I mean, any school that we've, that we've played, we have definitely by far the worst diamond. Um, and it's also, like, there's some safety concerns, too, because there's, like, a lack of drainage. So there's, like, the outfield, um, it's, sometimes it's not level. Our first half of the games were rained out, so we had to, like, cramp, we had to go, like, schedule the teams that we were playing home. We said, hey, can we play at your diamonds, for example? Um, that's not just a good experience, not only for kids, but for parents that, you know, like myself, I came here right from work. You know, you have to, last minute when it rains and you have to change the game, you kind of have to restructure your whole um, schedule. Um, Centennial is where the varsity team plays. That's 
uh, that's a town park. Um, it's not on site or anything like that. Um, I'm not going to get into it, but I have like five different bullet points that are specific safety issues that have been brought to me by current or former coaches that are on that diamond. Um, so, um, I mean, I'll give you an example. The field needs to be, needs a two-ton roller plus at as many unlevel spots in the outfield again. Um, which, again, like, my son enjoys baseball, but, like, there should be, like, the safety hazard of it, you know? Um, there's safety concerns from them playing at those two diamonds. Um, the next thing, though, is, like, school pride. Like, the reason why kids do play sports um, is, is for pride. Um, currently, right now, like, with them not having a diamond, like, it creates a lack of feeling of school pride and being a part of something, you know? Like, it's nice to kind of walk. I played sports in high school way back when. Um, you kind of walk out, you know, you play home, you know, it's exciting. Not to go somewhere else, they have to play. Um, imagine, like, if the basketball team, for example, had to play their games at the YMCA. How do you think, like, the basketball students and, and parents would feel? Um, and then just like the attract, like by having a diamond on site, it's just like attraction of the sport. Um, but it also, it's like more students will want to play, um, will attract better coaches who can mold these young men. Um, program will grow. And then I'm a firm believer that like playing sports teach a lot of skills in life. Like I'm a, I work at the corporate office at M&T Bank. Like a lot of the stuff that I do and learn, like I learn through teamwork and building teams and culture. And I learned that through playing sports in my life. Um, I don't know if I would want to play like if my high school didn't have a diamond on site, like I'm not sure if I would want to play for that school. Um, so it just, it's just kind of a shame. And I've heard that for, for the last couple of years, other parents have brought this up. So I think like now's the time to not reconsider this, come up with a plan. And that's what we're kind of looking for. Thank you. Thank you. I did it. I, I should. Can you help me? My name is Mary Astak. Um, I live at 247 Tim Tam Terrace. I am a longtime West Seneca resident. I actually was a graduate of West Seneca East and was a student, scholar, and athlete from West Seneca East. So I know what it means to be part of a team and represent at a school and be on a home turf. More importantly, I'm here today on behalf of my children. I'm a mom of three boys, two of which are upcoming into West Seneca East to play baseball. Um, my son is a sixth grader going into seventh grade, hoping to play baseball for West Seneca and represent for the district next year. I find it appalling that we right now have this disparity between West and East. Back when I went to school, it was a big kind of, it brought upon community, that sense of community, West turf, East turf, and now they, these boys don't have a turf of their own. They don't have a place to practice. They're being carted all over the district to be able to play their games. That's modified JV and varsity. These boys, we pay as taxpayers, we pay in to be able to make sure that these kids deserve e equality. And right now, there is not equality between West and East. The facilities are, I mean, at East, there's still the same concession stand from when I graduated back in the 90s. They're still porta potties. Yet West is getting all of these upgrades and amenities. To me, as, you know, I was proud to bring, come back to Buffalo, come back to West Seneca, and have my school kids go through school at East. And tonight I want to just say, I really hope that we can come together for these children to be able to provide them with acceptable conditions to be able to play a sport that they love. And it is a proven fact in studies that get keeping kids involved keeps them out of trouble. And we need to remember that, especially with recent events. And I really think that these children deserve this. And I really hope that we reconsider not re-looking at doing these fields, but we make a concrete plan and decide to move forward to give these kids the same the same facilities as their friends, current teammates that go to West have. And that's my story for tonight. I'll keep it short and simple, but I really hope that we can do this for our boys. They do deserve it. Thank you. Thank you.
Brittany Campbell and my address is 49 Mayberry Drive East and I'm here to actually piggyback off of this baseball issue. I'm here as not only a graduate of West Seneca East and a parent of a seventh grader who plays modified baseball this year and it saddens me to see that baseball has essentially been ripped out of our school. East is currently the only school in all of Western New York that does not have a diamond on their grounds. The diamonds, as far as I'm aware, were ripped out in 2019-2020 when the new track and turf was being put in. At that time, students, parents, taxpayers, and residents of the community were under the assumption that the diamonds were also being redone. We are now ending the 22-23 school year, and there is still no plan for these diamonds to be put back in. While other options have been provided, these substitutions are not a permanent fix, and the real issue it needs to be addressed. The diamond located over right here at West Seneca West is embarrassing to call a home diamond. Besides from the fact that we are traveling to our rival school to play games, the diamond has poor drainage and has caused a majority of rainouts in the beginning half of our season. Even when the weather was beautiful out, had time to dry out, our diamond was still underwater. Centennial Park, a town diamond, has safety issues between the lack of clay in the batter's boxes, catcher's boxes, and pitcher's mound, the ground's uneven, balls get hit into the lips, and end up hitting our players. Why are we injuring our kids? We are now showing not only our kids, but the hit kids who come to play at our diamonds, that East thinks of baseball as a second-hand sport. Our board and our school does not seem to care about this sport or the kids' safety. By putting a diamond in the school, the children get to feel that sense of pride and spirit playing for their school at their home base, as well as being the face of their school. That feeling of playing at home cannot be replicated at the town park or at your rival's diamond. The sense of pride is what school sports are about. We don't tell the football team, hey, go play your football game at the town park. Can you imagine what the uproar would be if we were to say that? Playing sports is more than just the competition. The kids learn teamwork and life skills that they will carry with them for eternity. Sports help to mold these children into adults, into the adults that they will be one day. A home diamond will not only benefit, kid, benefit the kids who currently play, but the kids coming into the school district and help grow the sport within, within our school. It's time to stop treating the baseball players like baseball is a second-hand sport to the school and time to start taking it seriously. And the first step is to give these kids their diamonds back. It's been way too long that these diamonds have been ripped out and gone. So I think what all of us parents are looking for tonight is a plan, something with dates, something that we can go home and tell our kids, you love baseball, this is your passion, you are going to play in your school for your school. And that's all I've got. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, board. My name is Chris Pop. I live at 132 Sunrise Terrace. I have three sons in the district, one in sixth grade, one in third grade, and one in kindergarten. We are f finishing our fifth year in the West Seneca District. I am actually a product of Hutch Tech High School in the city of Buffalo. I graduated in 1996. I mention that because city schools do not have home diamonds. I'm here for baseball, obviously, wearing my Hamburg Dogs regalia. Uh, still in baseball hangover mode. Uh, when I played for Hutch Tech High School, we did not have a home baseball diamond. Our diamond was Diamond 2 Delaware Park. I was able to play baseball in college. I played at Buffalo State College. I missed the time when it was Division Three. It was club sport. When I went there, and our home diamond was Sheridan Drive Park Number 2. Here we are 29 years later as a resident of West Seneca in a fantastic school district. I'm very proud of the education that my children receive within this district. But as my sixth grade son now moves into seventh grade next year and advances from being a student to a student athlete, my expectation is the district in which I own a home in and pay taxes in represents the same level of effort towards the sport that my, my sons appreciate and I love and grew up coaching and playing as the school district does. I want the district to match my level of enthusiasm. Between my, my son here who just won a tournament, Battle of the Falls, beat the best teams in Western New York at 11U, He's going to play 65 games this year and have 100 practices. His younger brother is not here because he's at practice right now for his travel team. He's going to play 45 games plus 20 house games and 35 practices. I have a t-ball kid. Take it for what it's worth. But um, <laughs> my expectation, I, when we moved into the, into the West Seneca five years ago, we had the expectation and knowledge that there was a complex being built to include football, track, soccer, baseball, softball, lacrosse. And that has not been completed. 
I just challenge the board to meet the expectations that new homeowners like myself and taxpayers like myself that love and support this game, not just baseball, softball as well, will match our level of, level of enthusiasm for the sport. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. All right. Um, Mr. Bystrecht and I, and I spoke about this. We were thinking to move on to um, approving personnel and then have the presentations afterward because we have a few people here who were, you know, who are waiting to be approved. So if you all don't mind, I'm just going to move on to the consent agenda and then move back to presentations. Okay with everyone? Okay. So we are going to skip number six on the agenda just momentarily, this will be very quick <laughs> to our presenters, um, and I'm going to move on to number seven, which is the consent agenda. So may I have a motion to approve the consent agenda, which includes agenda items seven through 11? I'll make a motion. All right, Molly makes a motion. I'll second. Jan seconds. There's no discussion on consent agenda items, so we will vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Nope. Okay, passes unanimously. Thank you. Um, I'm going to actually turn it over to Dr. Cervoni or Mr. Bystrek to introduce our... Sure. So I know we do have a couple of folks uh, whose names are on this part of the agenda. I wanted to start off just by... Uh, actually, it's Mrs. Fowler's around. I know you were going to pop up here, but I uh, just wanted to recognize one of our folks here, uh, uh, Ms. Joelle Burke. Uh, is our new one of our new directors of special education. Uh, I'm going to introduce Jackie Fowler, our assistant superintendent for exceptional education. Uh, Joelle's here with her family, whom we're going to ask to introduce in a moment here. But uh, Jackie, would you like to take a moment? Sure. I'd like to welcome Joelle. Joelle Burke is currently the um, coming to us from many years of experience as a special education teacher, special education administrator, um, special education VESID coordinator, as well as um, some other administrative positions, one being an elementary principal. We'd like to welcome Joelle. Joelle is a West Senior graduate just a few years ago and is, is coming back to join our special education and our student services team. We look forward to working with Joelle um, and I understand you are looking forward to focusing at the elementary level as well so welcome Joelle happy to have you looking forward to what we can do for our special education programs yeah. and services I understand you brought some folks with you yeah. first I just want to take this opportunity to thank um, the interview committee as well as the Board of Education for this appointment I um, started my career here in 1985 um, in West Seneca schools. I um, am so pleased <laughs> to be able to share my passion here um, with our community. So I brought my husband and my five children. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, and my wonderful mother who is also here. <laughs> Welcome, Joelle. Thank you. Welcome, Joelle. Welcome. 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 Thank you. <laughs> Very sweet. <laughs> now, I know we also had uh, Dr. Merkel receive tenure this evening. Uh, Dr. Merkel, do you want to just stand for a moment? Congratulations. I call him Bob. Bob is our director of CTE in the Academies program. He's been working with us for four years now. He's been doing an outstanding job and really has helped to move a lot of our programming, uh, specifically in the area of CTE, forward with programs like PTAC and help to increase our enrollment and really maintain a strong connection with BOCES, but um, also uh, working with Bob, too. He's done a phenomenal job with the Academies program that only continue to grow in this district. So congratulations to Bob. Um, one more time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Felt like we needed more applause. Do we have any of our other, I know there are other folks that got tenure tonight or maybe a permanent appointment from some of our CSEA staff. Is anybody okay. else here? Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> no. 
Congratulations, yep. everyone. Congratulations. Thank you for coming. <laughs> All right, sure. All right, thank you, everybody, for adjusting the schedule, I mean the agenda. So we're going to move back to presentations. All right, looks like first up, uh, we have uh, Young and Wright uh, for a capital improvement project presentation. a bit of a, uh, an update on some of your current and uh, upcoming thoughts on projects. Um, so uh, today uh, we don't we don't have our full team here. Uh, Tori, your project manager, and myself, Sean Wright, are going to give you the presentation for this evening. Let you know how our things are progressing. I, I apologize; my eyes are not that great, so I'm reading from here. <laughs> Uh, actually, we just finished uh, just finished the first portion of our, our 2022-23 uh, capital in, uh, outlay project. This was the infill of the West uh, Elementary uh, Gym Pool. Uh, this work consisted of removing the existing equipment, filling the pool in with concrete. Uh, that work was completed as scheduled uh, before this uh, the end of June, and that was a hundred thousand dollar capital outlay project. The upcoming capital outlay project, which uh, we're anticipating construction by the end of 2024, will be to, you, to provide all of the finishes to make this a more usable space. So uh, those, those uh, plans are in the, in, the, in the works right now. Uh, we'll be uh, reviewing that with the district, submitting it to the state education department, and much like this project, probably anticipate construction starting early spring of 2024. Just a quick update on the Smart Schools project. Um, the installment of this one is wrapping up. We're just working on final punch list items with the contractors and close out documents. So that one should be done um, shortly here. And then diving into the capital improvement project, Sean's going to review phase 1B. Uh, as you're probably all well aware, the uh, concession building has now been in, in use since about the uh, end of April. Uh, the contractors managed to get it open in time for a large track meet that was taking place out there. Uh, we're in the period right now that we call the punch list. The contractor has a list of deficient items that need to be repaired or replaced. Um, and in addition, we're still waiting for the, uh, the sliding gate to arrive so that can be installed uh, and then getting uh, uh, solder grass in place uh, along with a little bit of concrete repair out there. So uh, for the most part, that work is wrapped up. Uh, we anticipate that uh, all of that should be done by the, by the end of July with the exception of the gate, which we know has been on back order, and we're expecting that the first couple of weeks of July. So that should wrap that one up. Moving into our, our Phase 2 project, um, all of the work at uh, West Middle School has been completed and is under punch list right now. Uh, we're working with those contractors to get that building wrapped up by the end of the month of June. Uh, and so far that seems to be on schedule for, for, to allow for that. Um, work at Meth West East, 
East Middle School uh, has been taking place. Uh, canopy work has started. Um, the, the work uh, inside is taking place over the course of this summer and we're anticipated to have this project closed out by the fall of 2023. So. Uh, phase three of the capital improvement project takes place at the high schools. Um, so at West Senior, you have your science room renovations, um, intruder hardware, secure entries, that type of work. At East Senior, you have very similar type of work. Um, we're renovating the science rooms. We're also renovating the art rooms, music rooms, and main office to create a secure vestibule. Um, so as you can see by these pictures here, well, construction is well underway. Um, and we'll continue on at East Senior, and then the crews will move to West Senior. Um, overall construction for this phase will wrap up by December of 2024. Uh, the first part of phase four is the elementary school roofs. And we pulled this scope out to be its own separate project for phase four, so that way we could expedite the design and SED approval, so that way construction could take place this summer just to kind of speed things up a bit. The remaining phase four scope um, takes place at the elementary schools. We're renovating all the entries to create them um, to be a secure entrance. Um, replacing some exterior doors, um, intruder hardware upgrades, um, and some um, drinking fountain um, upgrades as well. So overall, phase four will be completed by the end of December of 2025. Um, so this shows an overall schedule for all those projects that we just went over. That red dotted line, um, you can kind of see where we're at now. So you can see we still have a couple more summers of heavy construction going on for the capital improvement project. Do you guys have any questions about that project? Don't forget, I've been waiting for that cup of coffee when it's all finished at West. All right, <laughs> I'll hand deliver it. <laughs> <laughs> you promised way back. In <laughs> I I have a question. Will yeah. we have secure entrances at all buildings at the end of phase four? Yes, the high schools, middle schools, and all the elementary and all the, schools okay. will have secure entrances. Okay. Yep. <laughs> By, was that tw December 2025 or 2024? 2025. Okay. Right. Yeah. <laughs> We're getting there. Yeah, thank you. Yep. Okay. Anything else? So that will complete all of the last capital improvement project. Yes. Okay. Yep. Okay. In the, in the capital overlay, that's um, that's something that's a yearly. Yep. Those. You know, can, yeah. Yearly. We use two years. Project. Yep. And we use two of those to one to fill the pool, the other to finish it. Yes. Okay. Yep. So last fall, the district formed the facilities committee, and we've been meeting with them to go over building improvement scope based on your building condition survey and other various improvements that the district would like to prioritize. Um, and as we were going through all these scope items, some essential things kept popping out um, that the district would really like to address sooner rather than later. So we kind of bumped these into two groups. The essential scope items, these are like your BCS items that you want to take care of right away, and some enhancement scope items that aren't necessarily BCS related, but still is a priority for the district to address sooner rather than later. So we're going to kind of go through those with you um, just to give you guys an update. So at the high schools, some essential scope um, that was outlined was the roof replacement at both the high schools reworking the site circulation at West Senior. Um, and when I say site circulation, I mean like the bus loop layout, student parking, staff parking, just reworking that to make that a safer environment. Um, and then some enhancement scope items was um, auditorium upgrades, um, which would be stage and lighting, um, sound and lighting and stage rigging, and then the baseball, softball um, fields at East Senior. At the middle school, some enhancement scope would be the auditoriums as well. Elementary school, um, some essential scope would be Northwood Elementary's roof. So if this roof was addressed and the two high schools that we just talked about, that would take all of the roofs at the district would be under warranty. So that would put you guys in a really good spot roof-wise for a while. Some other scope that we talked about um, was the playgrounds at the elementaries. 
Some of the playgrounds are in better shape than others, um, but we included all of them here because sooner rather than later, they all will need to be addressed for those. All right. Um, so to give you guys an idea of what that scope looks like from a budget standpoint, so you could kind of see where you would be from a referendum amount, um, we just put together some preliminary budgets for this. It's kind of hard to read um, from back here, but the roof scope would be about 14 million. Um, parking lot, we're still working on some preliminary sketches. We don't have an estimate for that yet. And then the enhancement scope, um, the total for the playgrounds is about 4.5 million. Um, the auditorium upgrades, I believe that says 6.8. Um, and then there's two different options for the baseball turf uh, or baseball softball field options. The turf option would be about $10 million. If we went to a grass option, that would be about $3 million. So we kind of broke it up this way so that way you guys could start to see um, from a big picture point of view how you want to build your next project. You know, it might make sense to do those roofs right away, um, but then you can start to look at these enhancement scope items to see what you deem as a priority to really put into your next capital improvement project. Um, and then just to give you an idea of a timeline point of view, um, if you wanted to potentially do a vote this December, this kind of outlines how you get to that point. So there are certain um, deadlines that you would have to meet to figure out the scope and schedule um, in order to get everything in place to have that vote in December. Um, and then we also talked about multiple other things um, at the facilities committee meeting. Um, there were some big ticket items that are a priority for the district as well, such as maybe air conditioning the buildings, UPK space, general classroom upgrades. Those scope items we can still continue to discuss and prioritize and help you um, plan for those scope items for a future um, vote that would be further down the line. And then just a summary of the BCS scope. There's lots of BCS um, items to pull from for our projects as well. Did you guys have any questions about that? That was a lot of information. That... Yes, I have a question. Yeah. Can you tell me which playgrounds are in need of the most dire need of repair? Um, I can Do you go know back by to building? The... I don't know by building um, okay. off the top of my head. I could probably jump in on that okay. a little bit. So okay. right now, Northwood and Winchester Potters uh, are probably the two that are most in need of repair. Um, Allendale and Westell are in pretty decent shape, and so is Clinton Street right now. So, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, my next question is: if you did, if we did not go with a December vote and instead went with June, what would be the difference in timeline? Like, how would that affect your timeline? Sure. Um, it would essentially push things out another six months. Mm -hmm. So after you have your vote, then we would start the design work, which takes a little bit of time, and then you have to put that design work into state education, which takes some time for approvals too. Um, so it would just delay it another six months. Okay. So how, how construction long? Construction delay, yeah. Constru okay. okay. All right. The, 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 the timing of it, though, because it has to go to the state education department, mm -hmm. uh, may change the time of year that you're able to bid the project and then what, when the next summer will be for you to, to perform the work. Mm -hmm. So that, that may be a factor. So you've got six months changing in, in the design period, mm -hmm. um, but then it, it kind of depends on how many summers you lose before you can go to construction um, and, and, and get the actual work put in place. As, okay. as you can kind of see with our current project, you know, once, once it votes, it takes a number of years in right. order to get the work completed. So. Right. Okay, my next, I have one more question. So, um, priority lists from buildings. Um, can the board see those per building? Like, what would, you know, be the priorities from each building? Maybe Mr. Bystrick can, you know, by, what, what, are our, what are our principals asking for, basically, for each building? What is their number one priority? Health and safety would be number one for me, but what is it for them? I would, I would just like to know. Can you go back to the slide? Yeah. We talked to very end. So in, in the committee meetings that we've been uh, that we've been holding since last fall, these are the items that seem to keep coming to the top of the list. 
Um, lot of, not a lot of nuts and bolts things, I would say, from, uh, from, from school faculty that way. Uh, more having to do with uh, the actual educational spaces, the ed educational climate, um, general classroom updates, libraries, air conditioning, auditoriums, restrooms, things like that were a lot of things. So you're seeing a lot of things that go, I would say, beyond the building condition survey and more into the, the you know, their experience in using these buildings and, and all, many of the spaces that are either, you know, very dated or just very, uh, very uh, in need of repair. Right. Okay. Thank you. Does anyone have anything else? Yeah, yeah I, I have a couple of, of different comments, I don't know if they're questions. Um, I can't see how Allendale Elementary is even on this list for a playground and has a brand new playground. I know that there are needs at Clinton and Northwood. Um, I don't believe there's a need for a new playground at West Elementary. Um, maybe Winpot needs, but you know, the, the, the topic of equity came up before and I don't think it always needs to be, well, if they get this, we get that. What we need to do is look at it from a larger perspective, is what is needed in our community. When the decision was made to build identical tracks in football fields at East and West, I think it was one of the worst decisions that was made in my time here in West Africa. Because you don't need, well, they don't both need the same thing. What we needed, what we needed was one complex that included track and field and football and softball and baseball. That all could have happened at East. And you may have had people that came and said, well, why doesn't West have that? Because we don't need both of them. But we definitely need one that offers everything. As a district, we're still going through a redistricting process, which is going to very possibly uh, lead to reconfiguration of who's attending school and what buildings. Um, there's a lot that needs to be discussed before we just say, well, let's give 1.7 to each school for their theater and their stage. Let's give everybody 8,500,000, 8, I'm sorry, 850,000 for a playground. Those two numbers right there equal the turf option at between the theater and the playground work, that equals 11.3, which would cover the turf over at East, which is necessary. We just heard it. There's nothing there. They have nothing. They don't need a new one. They just need something. And if we're going to do that, we're not putting in grass. We're not putting in grass, a grass field, and brand new. You have... Orchard Park ripping out one of the nicest diamonds in the area and replacing it with turf. Clarence has a dirt diamond that sits next to their brand new turf diamond that's better than anything we have in West Seneca. So we need to start looking at a larger thing, not an east side and a west side window. We need to look at the community as a whole, what the whole needs. So, no, those aren't questions, those are comments. Any other board members have anything they want to share? Thank you for your comments. I mean, I just want to make a clear, two clarification, I guess, comments on this. Just um, the uh, facilities committee is not done meeting, right? This is this is a proposal of things to consider. I think at one point you said all the playgrounds are on there because they eventually will need to be replaced. So we're not necessarily talking about replacing them all this year or this type of thing. Am I, am I getting? I was wondering because I wasn't part of all the meetings, so I just want to make sure I got it. This is more of like a whole. Oh, hey, these are some things you guys might want to consider. I don't know the process after this. I was not involved in the previous process. Do we meet more? Yeah. Does the board talk about it? Does it like how? Yeah, what is the process? Right now. Yeah, it's you're exactly right. Ed. The board. I mean, the committee, the facilities committee, really just comes up with some helps to sort of vet some ideas. But ultimately, the board, you know, through conversations like this and through Vince's comments, comments. And, Liz, ultimately the board makes the decision what projects they want to do. And to your other point about the playgrounds, no, you can you can target specific playgrounds that might be needier than others. You don't have to go for all or nothing. So, okay. so I, I, think, just, I just want to again clarify that just someone might be looking at this in the audience. It doesn't mean we're doing it. Right. It doesn't mean we're not doing it. We're, but I was not part of the process. How many years ago did this start? Six, seven, eight, one? ten years ago? Yeah, that was like 2007. Um, I was not part of that, so I'm unfamiliar with it, and I would be willing to bet that there's no board members 
here or at the next meeting that will that we're going to be part of it because our steam Jan is leaving us and you may have been part of it but we're all going to be new to this so the process is there's a lot more work involved in figuring it out like I I, I, I cautiously agree with Vince I would prefer turf again <laughs> I saw this size yeah. fall out of her head. Um, we, we, that's stuff we got to debate and look at the you know the positives and the negatives. Mm -hmm. But that's something we will be doing. I think we should probably schedule a work session. Okay. That's probably the best way yeah, to do I would it. Love it because mm -hmm. I mean because then we can bring everybody in the room. Together. And I like the idea of a potential vote in December. I think these are priorities that need to be addressed, and we need to prioritize things that um, you know there are big ticket items on here that I see as priorities when we're talking about quality of life inside of our schools. The roofs are a no-brainer. No it has to be done. So we have to get to that. I, mean, I think we need to hash this out sooner than later so that we can get to that December vote. I just feel like we've gone through a year, and here we are. We're still saying, well, uh, these aren't a list. So if we're not doing them, why aren't they a list? July work session? Yeah, I mean, let's make something happen. Not the, work session. Yeah. Particular year, and I, nothing got nothing like that. We got to cash out like that. So. The, right. uh, Thank the, you. The second part of my comment, I just want to clarify: a six-month delay in the vote could equal a year to a year and a half delay in construction. Yeah. I just want to be clear on that, just because I'm in, I'm in favor of moving forward sooner than later. But I want to. It's not a six-month delay. It could create a year to a year and a half delay. Mm -hmm. Am I mistaken in the, because of the seasons? No, yeah, you could, you're, you're correct in saying that, and okay. I think that if you know if, if there is a if, you know these are the kind of things that we can help provide. Uh, show we've shown you what a December vote looks like. We'd be happy to put together the same thing for say a June vote, so you can kind of see how it affects your schedule. Thank and you. Getting those things in place. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. That would that would be great. Yeah, I appreciate that. Would be great. Let's thank you. You're welcome. If we can get everybody in July, July is a busy month. Well. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Thank what you. else are we doing? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Thank you very much. All right, so we have another presentation. Um, Mrs. Fowler and Mrs. Logren, um, you're welcome to come up and present the 2023-2024 uh, Code of Conduct. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Hello, everyone. We do not have a formal presentation. We are going to just speak to kind of the process that we went through for the Code of Conduct, as well as just highlight some of the things that are within that. And I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Logren to walk us through that. Okay, so you all will have a draft of the Code of Conduct updates for this year. We just have minimal. And as you know, every year we have a committee that comes together, reviews the year, sees what we need to update, if there was any things this year during the school year that maybe were something to cause pause for us to revisit the language, et cetera. Last year we had some larger overhauls in the language and this year we took the time to review how is it going, what's the functionality of the changes, were they effective, and did we need to review everything. Um, that said, uh, in the draft that you had, anything in red was something that we are looking to eliminate, revise, and the yellow highlighted language were items that we felt we needed to either replace or reword or move. So there's minimal changes on pages 11, 13, 19, and 26. The first one that's up here is page 11 and that was probably our bigger page. Uh, in the high school specifically last year we had gone to um, a, a cell phone and electronic device zone usage in the high schools only. <laughs> Uh, so green was a, just like a, a street light, green was go, yellow was caution, red was a no. So uh, one of the things that we looked at um, in speaking with the committee this year was looking at uh, specifically in the red zone, um, shutting down cell phones in classrooms and in particular areas where um, we felt it was a no. And the feedback from the, the committee and the staff was that to move uh, classroom time up into yellow as a cautionary so that it would create more flexibility for the teachers uh, to utilize cell phones um, as need be or also to like study halls or areas where 
uh, it wouldn't just be an automatic green light, but it would be that the staff had permission to give the green light, and that's why we put in there. Um, and in classrooms during instructional times, unless permission is granted by a staff member. And then we um, took that out of the red zone and we just reworded uh, gymnasiums and pool area in the red zone. On page 13, um, we added, um, regarding late lateness for leaving, we added, um, it was just strictly the school, but we added class as well, so leaving the classroom and or the school, we added that language. Uh, we felt that it was important to eliminate number nine, which, uh, which was wearing of coats or jackets during the school day, which oftentimes you know it gets cold. Sometimes kids like to keep their jacket on. Some of these hoodies look like jackets. And so we felt like that was kind of an outdated uh, piece of language in there, and we felt it was important to eliminate that. And at the bottom, um, also for number one, under examples um, of engaging in contact that we felt was violent or in a violent nature, uh, we added spitting. That was not sp explicitly noted in there, but sometimes that has come up and the, the staff felt the need to add that explicitly. Uh, on page 19, um, in regards to any long-term suspensions from school, uh, the third paragraph down, you'll see we had in there that there was the right to appeal uh, for 10 days, and that was actually um, changed to 30 days, with, which was guidance and language that was recommended by legal teams for all districts. And um, last but not least, on page 26, just some rewording of visitors to the school to increase our security and safety and update some of the language. Uh, at the bottom, under visitors to school, number four, it's prior, uh, prior language was parents and citizens. We changed it to parents, guardians, and other visitors. Uh, we changed uh, who wish to visit the school in general versus observe a classroom. And um, we added obtain explicit permission from the building administrator prior to any visitation. So that um, permission is granted by building principals. They know who's coming in. There's a time. There's a schedule. And that creates a lot more security and safety for our schools. So those were the changes for this year. Again, like I said, um, very minimal. It seems like the changes we made last year are working well for everyone um, at this time. And like I said, we do revisit this every single year with a committee representative of all the districts, including um, upper administrators as well. Mr. Bystruck was there, Mrs. Fowler. Uh, we had student representatives, teacher representatives, um, and we have a dialogue and just talk about the what really works and what's not working. Any questions? Mm -hmm. It's important. Yeah, student yeah, voice is important. Yeah. Okay. Thank well, thank you so home. much. Thank you. Okay, so bear with me. Um, Liz had to leave this evening to attend her son's concert, so I'm taking over. Um, may have a few questions, Ed, help me out. Um, but we're going to move along to our English language arts and literacy presentation. So Mrs. Persico and Mrs. Bush, welcome. Thanks for coming. We're just going to move the podium over here so that you can see the screen better as you're presenting. And I know that was a problem for the last presentation, so it just, it'll just take a second. everyone okay. I think so yes so tonight we want to provide a brief presentation for the group um, regarding uh, what's been a busy year in English language arts across the district and we have two significant steps forward that we are proposing this evening and the first is an improvement to the overall universal screening process that we have here in the district 
we are proposing MAP and IXL together for grades 6 through 10, as well as iReady, which is a change from MAP completely to iReady for grades K to 5. In addition to exploring a new universal screener, we have also been embarking upon a journey to find a new uh, tier one resource for English language arts. And so tonight we present to you for um, hopefully your approval, Benchmark Advance for grades K to five. We found that Benchmark Advance was the all encompassing program. It was really, it has students as active learners and collaborators in their own uh, journeys with English language arts culturally responsive as well, included assessment piece. And so we will speak to you in greater detail on each of these two things over the next several minutes. So we found that um, IXL was really a missing piece for the MAP component, especially at the secondary level. Uh, we do administer MAP, as you know, three times a year, at the beginning of the year, middle of the year, and then end of the year as benchmarks. It does provide the teachers with student performance data, but what it lacks is those next steps. So you have the posts for the fence, but you don't have the rungs in between. Um, and really adding that piece of IXL really helps to give us the skill practice that the students need to improve their performance. So MAP and IXL systems do talk to one another. They provide the answers to the now what. So you would give a MAP assessment and a teacher would have the results, but then what do you do with that? So IXL really helps to lend itself to what are the skills, what do we do now? And those can be assigned by the teacher or self-selected by the student. Um, and then brief tips and videos help the students to stay on track. So Robin, I don't know if you want to chime in a little bit here as our middle school teacher who piloted IXL. So I'm a math teacher. Just yep. Know, we were doing this for both ELA and math. So we enjoyed that it was all of those contents. But one of our favorite things about IXL is that once the kids take their MAP test, all of their scores can be inputted and they get an individualized New York State personal plan. So any student that takes a MAP test, as soon as their scores are inputted, they can go to their own personal plan and see where their weaknesses were and they can work on those at their own pace or as a teacher directed pace. And it was, as Carm said, it was the missing piece that we had. We had all the information from MAP, but we didn't have anywhere to go with it. So this was this was the hugest piece for us, is to know that they could get a personal plan. But our teachers are using it too, and they're taking certain pieces of information that they may need a little bit more standardized test practice with, or kids just need their own independent work to do on a particular concept, and we can direct them to that area. And they do self-select, and they actually like it. Any questions about IXL? Oh, yeah, so we looked at iReady as well, and we discovered that iReady is definitely more based toward the elementary level. The assignments that are given are elementary level, and students don't have a choice, and teachers don't actually have a choice in what the kids are working on. It's all based on the testing that they do. Whereas if they take the MAP test, and we have iXL, we can go ahead and assign tasks no matter what concept. There's so many concepts we can assign that task as we see it. Or what we're seeing in class, we can assign that. And it's practice, and they have a video option, but they don't have to watch the video. If they need a little bit of practice, they can watch the video on that question. Or if they get something incorrect, there's a whole series of information that tells them exactly what they needed to do and what they should have done. And then IXL works along with MAP, and it takes them to the next level when they're ready, or it pushes them back a level when they need to. Anything else? So in regards to our elementary screener, we are moving full scale or proposing to move full scale to the iReady for grades K to five. It really was an all-in-one program that the teachers felt really met the needs um, as well as our students. We surveyed the students who were involved in the pilot and the feedback was overwhelmingly positive. Students really liked it as did the teachers. So the iReady is both, right? It's the universal screener and the skills practice and it's also intervention. This, like MAP, is administered three times a year. It provides our student performance data along with those next steps for instruction. It gives lesson plans and resources for the next steps, both in print and digital formats. It has a path for each student based on their need. That's a digital path. 
It provides a variety of skill practice through gaming, so that is really an attracting um, component of the program for the kids really like that gaming structure and the group's students according to need. So a teacher can essentially look at the results of the assessment and group kids based on like need uh, to further their learning. It provides teachers and students with tips, videos, and then we have lessons for the reteaching and intervention component as well. And I think that based on discussions with teachers and students who have been involved with the pilot as well as their building administrators and students, it's super user friendly. It's very intuitive. It did not have a very big learning curve. I think our teachers who are here can uh, corroborate that. So I'm just going to ask Jen if you wouldn't mind just talking a little bit about iReady and your experience with that. Um, so yes, so iReady um, was very easy to use. Um, as we've said, it's very user friendly. You were able to um, put the children right on it um, and instantly they were excited because the games were engaging. Um, plus it was all at different levels. I saw some games on there, for example, some students that are at the lower level, they were playing games with letters. A little turtle was trying to find the letters of the alphabet. The directions were there, they instantly popped up. Also, as soon as the students um, go into the game, it's just a quick what to do, and it instantly goes to what is assigned to them, which was very nice for the teacher, um, because then they just opened it up and started going. Um, when we had the presenter come and talk to us about it, um, it was recommended about 10 to 15 minutes a day, so this wouldn't replace a lot of instruction. It's more to reinforce. Um, after the test is given so that the kids have that extra practice. Um, and also, as uh, Car mentioned before, it does go up, it does go down based on their level and how they're doing on some of those tests. It'll move up to something a little bit harder and then it'll also bounce back. Um, I witnessed as well um, when the children were logging on that it would give them the directions and would also give them a little bit of a practice because this was something new. They did have to learn how to manipulate some of the games. Um, the other part that's important too is that it is math and reading, so you can do either or. They could practice math facts, they could also practice reading. And at the primary level, a lot of the games and activities are for those foundational skills, and then it kind of builds them up to reading passages, answering questions. The reading passages also look like a book. Actually, that was the only thing we had a little trouble with, was learning how to turn the pages of the text. It did explain it, but it was a little confusing at first. Um, and then there was a question afterwards, like what is the character, what is the setting, similar to what we would be doing, but the picture was there, it was on the computer. And then also it would give you a printout if you wanted to, you could click on each individual student, see what their needs were, and it would provide the teacher um, like a little script, like if your child is having trouble with this particular lesson or this particular skill, you can try this. Here are some other activities. Here are some other things to practice with them. So a teacher could use that with a small group because it does give you the other children in that grouping. So you could group them together, pull a small group at the table while the other kids are working on something else or while they're working on their other activities too. So, sorry. Good question. Oh sure. How many how many teachers? I think oh. for Carm. Okay. How many teachers used iReady this year? We had uh, two grade levels at each of the two buildings that piloted. So mm -hmm. at Northwood and Winchester Potters, it was first grade and fourth grade. Um, there's about four at each grade level. So about sixteen to twenty mm -hmm. teachers. Okay. At two grade levels. Just for two to start. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then next year, it's full implementation. That's our goal. What's the what's the game plan for um, developing teachers' ability to implement what was just discussed there? Yep, we have a complete professional development learning plan, um, and Carol is going to detail that with you a little bit further down. Um, yeah, just for I, just iReady, we're talking about right for iReady and also potentially Benchmark as well. We have that whole PD plan here at a glance that um, Carol's yep. worked really hard to develop. So. Um, Given that we are going to make a full uh, sweep to iReady at the elementary, hopefully after this evening's uh, meeting, and then maintaining MAP at the middle school, there is some bridging of data that needs to happen. And so we have reached out to um, those at the MAP and WEA, and we have 
been given the resources to archive that information because we want to make sure that we don't lose that where the kids are because there is similar information that is collected between both of the programs. The consistent, the performance levels are consistent between the two, MAP and iReady, and also data from both of the systems are analyzed, synthesized for teachers, um, especially at grade six as you have kids um, who were in fifth grade coming into sixth grade. So we are currently working out the system on how to archive that data so we do not lose it and then we could crosswalk between both iReady and MAP moving forward. So, yeah, just to speak a little bit on the iReady map situation where we have iReady for K through 5 and we have map through 6 through 10, um, it was kind of an unintentional consequence because they were both piloting at the same time. And as they went through those pilots, they really found valuable pieces in both in both programs. Um, Robin hit the nail on the head when she said that iReady is more... Um, appropriate for elementary because what happens at the elementary level is that, um, and Jen kind of alluded to this too with the foundational skill piece, um, what happens at the elementary level is that oftentimes kids grow in a window. They don't all hit their benchmarks at the same times. So where some kids might learn to read by the end of kindergarten, you might have some who are more like a second grade where they finally spread their wings and, and fly. Well, what happens is as the kids get older, the older they go up, the higher they go up, the teachers have less foundational skill knowledge. So if you, get teach, if you get kiddos in third, fourth, fifth grade who are struggling with that phonemic awareness and phonics and some of those more foundational skills, that's where iReady can truly benefit the teacher because there are lesson plans, there are videos for the teacher to watch as well to be able to say, okay, I have this fifth grader, but I really need to work on phonics, so I can take a look at the iReady materials in here and I can learn how to do this phonics lesson with my fifth grader. So just kind of putting that in a little bit more perspective for you as far as iReady being more of an elementary geared um, resource. And another thing too, just about MAP, um, again, Robin hit the nail on the head with it having multiple subjects. So when you head into the high school, very rarely do you ever find a tool that has more than math and ELA. It's just hard to find. They don't have social studies, science, world languages, all of that. Um, so I'm very curious. We are only looking at it right now for math and ELA. We're sticking with math and ELA, lining it up with our map assessments for grades 6 through 10. But um, I'm very curious to see how that goes and if we can expand that into science and social studies in some way, shape, or form. But that would be down the road. So just some food for thought. So Robin uses that in a learning lab, correct? Uses right. map in the learning lab? They yeah. use that in their like, regular block? I can speak to that, yes. Okay. So um, some of the teachers, what they have been doing with IXL in their classroom is it's like the five-minute warm-up. So when the kids are coming in, the very first thing they do is get on IXL, they do their five-minute warm up or whatever and then the teacher starts the class. So it's kind of something that um, kids can practice skills while teachers are taking attendance, checking the homework, doing those kinds of things and then they close their Chromebooks, they're done with that and they move on with their lesson. So it's just that practice, a practice time. And then of course also study halls because we always have kids in study halls who don't have anything to do. <laughs> so you can always access your um, IXL materials in study hall as well. I'm just curious how iReady is going to so at the iReady level, we've, I've had some conversations with uh, the elementary principals, and the way that we're looking at iReady at the elementary level is through intervention. That's going to be our primary method of implementation. So hopefully, if we are able to pull it off, and when I say pull it off, it has to do with master scheduling, because as you know, master scheduling is tough. Um, but our plan is that we will have an intervention block at each grade level. So K will have its own intervention block, one will have its own intervention block, and so on and so forth. So then you can take all of your specialists that are in the building and you can deploy them to that grade level at that time. Would you so, have a walk to model? Are you talking like would kids be going to different spots or would everybody stay with their own home teacher? Um, no, they would be going to all different spots. They would be going all over the place. And what's nice about that is if, all, if the entire grade level has the intervention block at the same time, you can also start to embed enrichment into that as well. Because not every kiddo needs an intervention. And we have to start bringing enrichment back for our gifted and talented kids who need it. So if we get that intervention block in place, 
between the classroom teachers, they can decide, okay, who's going to take enrichment, who's going to take this group, who's going to take that group, and then you also have other kiddos who are headed off to a reading specialist, who are headed off to their consultant special ed teacher for a resource room, or they're headed off to standalone services with the ENL. So everyone's kind of going in different directions, and then ultimately you're going to end up with some kiddo who you need something that they can do, and that would be a perfect opportunity for iReady, where they could get on, they have their my path, which, which is targeting their skills, and then they would be able to move forward like that. The other key piece, and I know that this is something that no one ever talks about, but it's a very real thing, we have a sub shortage. We have a sub issue. Every district has a sub issue. So what happens when the reading teacher is absent? What do they get? Do they miss their intervention? Well, now we have an opportunity to give them something instead of nothing when that reading teacher is absent. So there, there are some other additional uses for iReady as well. But iReady will be strictly more of that intervention component in that intervention block that we're planning to use, um, or how the elementary teachers will be embedding it into their day. We found that iReady only goes to eighth grade content, but iXL goes above that into high school content. I have seventh graders that are solving ninth grade inequalities that would never have seen them unless it came up on their personal plan, and they love it. They love being able to go home and say, I just solved ninth grade math today. I'm going to do this again. What's, what, what else can I do? So we would not have had that opportunity with iReady at the secondary level. So I just want to point the piece out. And the same is actually true at the elementary with iReady because it goes up to the eighth grade level. So if you have any K through five students who are excelling, they also have their own personal path. So if they're above the grade level, they are going to be challenged with grade level content that's above their grade level, going all the way up to eighth grade. And same thing, they get excited about it. They are excited that they they're higher than what their grade level is. So that's exciting for a kiddo. So. Access it at home too, and I will tell you, um, I, as an elementary principal, I had both iReady and iXL in my building, and they go home and use it. They use it. I could monitor their progress. They go home and use it without being told to. They just do. So that's another pro to the... Um, both programs. Okay, so you had asked about support. How are we going to support our teachers? Huge, huge piece to the puzzle. So in terms of training for um, IXL and MAP, really it's more IXL that they need training on. MAP, most people know. It would probably just be new teachers who would need that training on MAP. But throughout the summer, there will be ARO opportunities that are offered. So they can certainly take advantage of that. Anybody who does not take advantage of summer ARO opportunities will have the opportunity to train on opening day. So that is MAP and IXL. That's the plan for that. iReady, they will also have opportunities to, well, we have a, a group of teachers, about 16 to 20, that have already received their first training because they piloted. So those teachers are all set. We will also offer ARO opportunities for people who haven't been trained in iReady throughout the summer so they can take advantage of that. If they don't take advantage of that, they will not be training on opening day because provided that we move forward with a new ELA program, we will be focusing on that opening day. So instead, what we would do for the people who don't use the ARO hours, we would pull them out like half day sessions where we do a group in the morning, group in the afternoon, with um, a BOCES presenter for iReady. And actually, I'm already work, working with her to identify different approaches because you can do three-hour trainings, you can do two-hour trainings, you can do one-hour trainings. So it all depends on how much information you want to give people at once. So it's also possible that we could do the training for iReady without any release time for teachers because they also have grade level meetings each month. So we could very easily have the BOCES presenter there for the day and then they could just rotate through each of the grade levels and train them on how to administer iReady at the grade level meetings. So there are lots of options for the elementary teachers with iReady um, if, they if they choose not to take advantage of the ARO opportunities in the summer. So does that kind of cover what 
for the support and the training piece? Yes, thank you. Yes. Um, okay. So now we're going to shift into ELA because we have been working a ton on identifying a new ELA resource for Tier 1. So I really quickly just wanted to revisit the last few things that I talked to you about. We were building our book collections up last time I spoke. That we're still continuing to do. And if we move forward with Benchmark like we are hoping to, books are all included in that. So we would not have to continue building up that book collection because it's already embedded in the resource that we would be moving forward with. Um, we've been talking a lot about best practices. You know, there's a lot going on out in the field of reading and literacy right now. So really making sure that we are grounded in what we know is great literacy instruction. It's easy to be, I call it the razzle-dazzle effect, it's easy to be razzled and dazzled by vendors and anybody. You get on Twitter, you get on Facebook, it's so easy to fall victim to whatever it is that somebody's putting in front of you, positive or negative. So I'm constantly trying to remember or remind people Keep yourself grounded in what you know are best literacy practices. Always. We know that and we'll continue to work on that. Um, exploring new resources. I'll talk about that a lot in just a second. We also talked about how we are trying to build a repertoire of interventions for our specialists. Because remember, when we're dealing with interventions, you have to, if, if the intervention that you are working is not, or if you're using is not working, you have to have another intervention to try before you can go and like refer a child to special education or something like that. You got to try a couple different um, options because it's not one size fits all when you're talking about intervention with children. So uh, we talked about building a repertoire of interventions. And then the last thing we talked about the last time I was uh, presenting was establishing our core values and beliefs. And even though we haven't done that in terms of like a standalone document, we have been doing this in terms of, as we've reviewed all of these resources, as a group we have talked about what we believe in and what we value for our kids and their education here in West Seneca. So it's really been a fantastic process. But anyway, okay, so let's get into the uh, new resources for Tier 1 because this is really why we're here tonight so that I can kind of explain this process to you and, and what we've been doing. Um, so the way that it started, I shared with you last time that I went through the building visits with all five elementary buildings, and that's where I heard loud and clear, we need to look for something else. I heard it loud and clear. I said, well, okay. So we started this, this project, if you will. We put together an ELA curriculum review team, and it consisted of about 20 to 25 members. There were three people from each elementary building on the team. We made sure that we had representation from special ed, from ENL, from administration, from the district level, from the building level. Of course, classroom teachers, we tried to get as many perspectives as we possibly could in looking at these resources. Um, and then we actually explored a lot of programs. And um, the people in this room who were part of the team can definitely attest to that. We looked at seven core programs and we looked at three phonics programs. That's way more than you should ever put in front of a group of teachers. It's just way too much. However, I'll explain that the reason why I did that is because I'm brand new. I am in my first year. The people that I am working with, they don't know me. They don't know me. I haven't established that trust yet. So if I were to just say, here, here are two programs. Let's look at these and pick one. I'm sure there would be a lot of question about how I came to those two programs. And not knowing me and not knowing if I have, you know, a strong caliber or whatnot, they would probably have questions about what I did. So instead, I said, you know what, anything I look at, they are also going to look at. And we did this whole entire project together. When all was said and done, we landed on basically three top resources. Benchmark Advance and Bookworms were our top two when it came down to the core programs. If we needed a standalone phonics program, we chose Wilson as the top front runner for phonics only. Now the thing with Wilson is it's only phonics. So you don't have your reading, you don't have your writing, it's just a phonics program. So we kind of said, okay, if the reading and writing program that we choose has everything we need, okay, we're great. If it doesn't, then we would look for, we would look at Wilson Foundations for that missing phonics component. So we kind of 
buffered both ends of it. So we made sure we had everything. Um, benchmark advance, actually, before I go to that, do either of you want to say anything about the process that we went through? Hi, I'm Sue Bergio, and um, I teach third grade at Allendale. And um, we really did look at each of these programs in depth, and we had a great team of teachers from that Carol has explained that was represented. Um, and when we say we had this in depth, we were actually taking it home, looking through it, and actually taking pieces of it and implementing it into our classroom even to see, does it work for real instead of just on paper? And um, it, many, many hours of looking at it and comparing and then coming back to revisit some of the different programs. And I think we did a very thorough job of looking at each of the programs. I don't know if Jen, if you want to speak any more on it, but really it was just an in-depth look at each of the programs. It wasn't just look at it, brief through it. We had in-depth meetings and we met with our teammates and vertically and even within our own grade level. So we had great so conversations. We talked about it at our buildings. We met mm -hmm. with principals. Um, we did have grade mm -hmm. level meetings yeah. that we were able to bring some of the materials to grade levels and discuss with some of the other teachers that maybe weren't part of their committee or sure. part of the committee, but to see what their yeah. pluses or minuses were, um, what they liked about it, maybe what they disliked about it. Sure. Um, Every um, teacher did bring the program back to meet within grade level. So it's not just our opinion of it. Right. It's the building. You know, anybody who wanted some um, that had interest in it came and met with us. So, like I said, it's not just the, the people that were at this meeting. We represented our building, too. So it, there was a lot of people involved, a lot of time involved for us. Lots of little displays around the library and the cafeteria. <laughs> um, thank you, Sue. Um, so, okay, I did put in a slide that shows a side-by-side -side comparison at a, like in a snapshot of Benchmark Advance and Bookworms because those were our top two resources at the end of um, our work together. I'm not going to spend the time to go through this just for the sake of time, but if anybody has any questions regarding how the two programs matched up or didn't match up, I'd be happy to answer any of those questions for you. Um, the biggest difference, as you can see, is going to be in the assessment category and also the reading category. Those seem to be the two big differences when it comes to Benchmark Advance and Bookworms. So like I said, if anyone has any questions about the actual program, I will gladly sit down and chat with you, but just for the sake of time, I'm going to keep moving about the process. Um, okay, so what pushed Benchmark Advance ahead in comparison to Bookworms? Because basically when we got to the end, everybody was like, okay, we've got Benchmark and we've got Bookworms, and we like them for very different reasons. They're very, very different programs. So we said, okay, well, what's going what's gonna to push one of them ahead of the other? And these are the pieces that kind of set benchmark aside. First of all, it is noticeably different from what people have been doing. When they look at the benchmark advanced curriculum, it is different, significantly different from what they're used to, which is good and bad. Um, you know, of course, everybody wants to be in that comfort zone where you're used to and comfortable with something. But at the same time, um, when we looked at bookworms, we felt that it was similar to the units of study in style and we were afraid that what might happen is if people see that the style looks similar, they're going to miss the nuances of bookworms that make it different than the units of study. Basically, we didn't want people to revert back into old habits with the units of study. So it was significantly different when we looked at it. Um, the alignment to the New York State standards cannot be... Um, emphasized enough. Yes, of course, it's aligned to the next generation ELA standards, but it's also aligned to the social studies standards, New York State, and the New York State science standards. It provides a clear scope and sequence for our teachers, and this is the component that has been missing the entire time, is that scope and sequence. You know, what is the scope of the work, and then do we have enough time to actually teach and have students learn all of the things that are in our scope. So that is a big difference um, compared to what we've been working with. We finally have that scope and sequence with this resource. Um, the robust assessment system. When we talk about assessments, you know, there are lots of different kinds. There's your traditional quizzes, tests, those kinds of things. But what's nice is that 
in Benchmark Advanced, they offer that, but they also offer inquiry-based projects, they offer rubric-based assessments, they offer group projects as assessments, they just have such a variety. So it's not always sitting down and taking a test. There are lots of different ways for kids to show you what they know. Um, and when they do sit down and actually take a quiz or a test, what's nice about that is that it is mirroring the state test in terms of the format. So that kids, that's one thing that is, is a little annoying, you usually have to stop and take time to teach kids how to manipulate the test. Well, if this is just part of the curriculum, they're going to be used to that already. They're not going to have to worry about that and manipulating the assessment. Um, Benchmark Advance was definitely the most comprehensive system that we looked at. And when I say that, I mean it doesn't just have materials and resources for our classroom teachers. It provides companion resources for your special education teachers for your ENL teachers, and for your reading specialists. And that's something that not a lot of um, resources do. So when normally you have your classroom teacher teaching whatever content they're teaching, when the child goes with their special education teacher or the ENL teacher or so on, those teachers usually have to scramble to find materials that are at the right level for their kids and based on the same content as what the teacher is teaching in the classroom. That is a challenge every single time for our specialists, where Benchmark Advance provides those resources for them. I'm not saying that special ed, ENL, reading won't ever need another resource, because like I said, one size doesn't fit all when we come to our kiddos who really have special needs, but this is something that we've never had before, these supporting resources for ENL, special ed, and reading. So it's remarkable. Um, the professional learning package, they provide over 10 days, I think it was 13, 13 or 14 days of professional learning is part of the package. That is huge because the one thing I heard loud and clear from the teachers as I went on my building visits is that they want to be supported. They don't want to be handed something and say, here you go, have fun with it. We're not, we're, you know, you're on your own. That's not going to happen. I've put together an entire calendar that supports teachers at their pace, so the people who want to go over the summer can go, the people who want to do some over the summer, some in the fall, like so on and so forth. I've set up a beautiful calendar for them, um, but the professional learning can't be understated. When I reached out and started asking about professional learning with bookworms, what I learned is that the professional learning with bookworms is absolutely exceptional. However, it is also exceptionally hard to get because they are a nonprofit organization. So because they're a nonprofit, it's extremely difficult to get the people out. Once you get them, they're, they're amazing, but you're not going to have anything like a systematic process where you can count on 13 days scheduled throughout the year that's going to support teachers. So, I, I mean, that's a huge game changer right there. Teachers need to be supported. And they provide that level of support that teachers will need. Um, and then, of course, the last thing is that it's most cost effective. And the reason I say that is because it's encompassing all of those extra people. Special education, ENL, reading. That, I mean, normally when you're buying any type of ELA program, it, is, it doesn't include all of those things. Those things are all extras. These come as part of the package. And it's, I also, in my previous position, I was a grant writer at my district. So I know that when I saw this cost, I was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Like, we're getting a steal. We're getting a deal. But I also know that it's sticker shock when you look at it. <laughs> it's a lot of money up front. But when you think of all of the pieces that you're getting and that last bullet about everything being in print and digital, that's also something that most companies charge for. You can't have everything. You have to pay extra to get the digital component. This, it's all one package. So that was another huge selling point that pushed us push this program ahead of the other one. But that PD, I mean, you get, teachers need to be supported, plain and simple. And with five buildings, you, like, that's a lot of PD. And, and like we said, we did look at quite a few different programs. Um, Sue and I are also veteran teachers, so we've used several different programs as well. 
So there were parts that we knew that we liked from other things, parts that we didn't like from other parts, and we kind of really wanted to look at this with an open mind and, and look at everything. Um, one of the things that stuck out to me with Benchmark, um, one of the bullet points up there, is that um, the access to resources in both print and digital. Picture our reading program when we were children, you had a thick book full of stories and you never took that book home to share with your family. This is one big thing. Um, it's 10 different booklets and at the end of each unit you do take that home. Um, it might be on another slide, I might be jumping ahead. But um, also in the very back, it has suggested activities that you can continue to do with that booklet that you take home. It also, kindergarten, first grade, second grade is all connected. So if they are learning about space, it's first grade space in the solar system, but then it's also second and third. So ch um, families with multiple children can have that connection, can have that family conversation as well. Um, also, because it does have that digital access as well for teachers, there's things that we can push out to Google Classroom as well. Um, and I'm just trying to think off the top of my head. Um, the big part is everything is right there. One of the things that the committee suggested as well is that at most grade levels, we have three or four teachers because this is going to be new. We will have professional development, but we also need to support each other. So we suggested um, we could even break it apart by grade level. One person could really kind of take the lead on maybe that theme story for the week and help to kind of look at it and digest out the other parts to other teachers as well. Somebody focus on the phonics. Um, so we could kind of coach each other and support each other so it's not everybody overwhelmed all at once, especially if you have a new teacher at grade level. Um, it, it could be a lot. The other, on the other side of that, though, um, when there is a need for a substitute or you are trying to look to the, try to bring it all together, Everything is pretty exclusive. It's really spelled out for teachers as well. And it'll explain this project connects to this story. This writing project connects to what you just learned. It really does have that connected feel. So it's similar conversations throughout your entire day for social studies as well, especially science and social studies are really brought into it. I, I would just like to add that the program is very rigorous, but it has room for differentiation. There's a lot of infer intervention pieces that can be implemented, but it also keeps your high kids growing. It is, um, as we said, aligned to the standards for science and social studies, which this is the part that really I, I like the most is that we're teaching our science BOCES kids, but it's aligned to our reading. So these kids are getting their, um, just their background knowledge is growing and they're learning above and beyond just a science kit. They're actually getting immersed into their science curriculum, social studies curriculum, deeper at a higher level. And they can also have, as Jen said, having parents involved at the end of every unit. So if we have, you know, I know in third grade, the first unit is adaptations. And at the end of the unit, the kids get to take home a parent packet to um, extend their learning. So it doesn't stop right there. The other piece that I know Carol spoke about was having that intervention piece for your, um, like your consultant teacher. They're learning the same um, material as the kids in the classroom. So you're building this community of learners, whereas a lot of times if you have consultant teachers taking kids out of the room or pushing in, they're doing a whole different curriculum. This keeps our classroom together and our conversations then in the elementary, you know, at the elementary level, Everything, you know, science isn't at this block. It goes throughout the day. And our conversations are together and continuously throughout the day. So it does bring this sense of community to the kids that sometimes miss that. So to me, that was important. The assessment piece also very important. Um, and I'm going to speak for the intermediate grades, three through five. Um, we're at that stage where we're reading to learn. You know, the K through two is learning to read if you can kind of get into that mindset. And when you're building that vocabulary acquisition, um, this program really has that embedded in there. And having those assessments too, and like I said, there, there are um, different modalities of the assessments, but we do have the opportunity to have that online component that aligns to the state test, which we have never had. 
and it would be nice to have that kind of built in so that we don't have to take that extra time trying to get on to different programs that really didn't work well when we did try. So, and all the tools are aligned right to the state assessments. I don't know if anybody has any questions that you want to stay answer. So, we talked a little bit about providing the support for teachers, and that is going to be the most critical part in this entire um, endeavor. And I did link into the PowerPoint my calendar. I also sent that ahead of time, so hopefully you were able to review that. I don't know how to click on <laughs> Anyway, um, we have three different cohorts. One cohort would do all of their uh, training in the summer so that they're up set, ready to go for the fall. These are my nervous Nellies. These are my people who want to have everything just situated and feel great about it. Then there's some people who want to get started in the summer, but they don't want to give up all of their time in the summer. So for those people, I have kind of a half and half where they'll start to do some of their PD over the summer, but then on opening day, that's when they'll really have their kickoff and move forward from there. And then my third group would be my fall cohort, and that group would start on opening day, and they will begin in September and move forward that way. So teachers will really have an opportunity to pick the training pathway, the professional development pathway that makes the most sense for them and makes them feel the most comfortable um, with moving forward with this. Um, the training will be a combination of digital and live training sessions. I love that because the digital is self-paced, so you can kind of just go at your own pace. And whenever you're learning something new, sometimes you have to hit pause and just digest that for a second before you move on. So I love that. And then, of course, we'll have plenty of live trainings. Digital will mostly take place over the summer, um, with the exception of the one live training for those people who are in the summer cohort. But throughout the school year, those trainings will be live. Um, and then ARO hours, I'm going to offer them whenever possible. That was a huge request from classroom teachers was please, please, please give us ARO hours that are embedded into something that we are already working on so that they didn't have to go out and do something different. They could really focus on whatever the main initiative was. So I will be offering that for sure. Um, and then, of course, sustained throughout the year. And then um, for our specialists, meaning... Um, ENL, special education, reading teachers, they will also be going through this same track with the classroom teachers so that they know what is happening in the classroom, but they will have their own designated sessions that are specific to a reading specialist, specific to an ENL teacher, specific to a consultant teacher, because they are different roles. They all need additional resources for their kids, but they need different resources for their kids. So they will have their own individual trainings that are specific to them. Um, I'm going to offer that throughout the summer, but then I will also offer it throughout the school year. So either way, they can do ARO opportunities or, and because they're a smaller group, we can pull them out um, to do like a training during the day instead of doing it on like a superintendent's conference day. We could pull, you know, our four elementary ENL teachers and do a training with them. So we could make that work. So that is our plan as of right now. Um, to support our teachers through the process if it is approved tonight. Um, and then the last thing I just really wanted to mention uh, before I end is that the five principals, Carm, myself, we all sat down and we had a really great conversation because it came down to bookworms and benchmark. That, I mean, and it was like, okay, which one are we going to go with? Because they were both exceptional for very different reasons. Um, and what we ended up, obviously we picked benchmark, but the things that we talked about in that meeting is that all of us, the five of them, the two of us, we are committing to this implementation. No one's going back to their building and closing their doors and saying, I'm doing my own thing. We have committed as a team that we are going to implement this together. We're going to implement it with fidelity. The first year through, you always have to do it with fidelity. Because how do you know if it works if you haven't done it the way that it was laid out to be done? Um, when we do have to make adjustments, 
we will make those adjustments as a district. It's not going to be, okay, well, Northwood doesn't like this, so they're going to kick this out. Clinton likes this, so they're going to put this in. Or No, we're going to make these adjustments as a district, and we will honor our teachers' voices. That was a very important thing that came up in that conversation with the principals, Carmen and myself, is that our teachers are professionals, and they know what they are doing. So we have to hear them. We have to listen to what they're saying. So as we go through this process, if we feel there's something that needs to be adjusted, we're going to do that. Um, but as a district. And then follow through with teacher accountability. Just like we talked about not going back to our buildings and doing our own thing, teachers can't go back to their classrooms and do their own thing. They have to be part of the team. So we talked about all of that as being a critical component. We all agreed that we are all leading this together. There's a team of seven as the leaders leading the charge. Um, and then the last piece I just wanted to mention, the first bullet, when we have teachers who are on the same page, speaking the same language, yes, you're going to have improved student performance and teacher performance, of course. But the other two pieces are just as important. You are going to have improved building culture and classroom culture, and you are also going to have increased parent involvement. When you have all of these pieces working in tandem with one another, that's what happens. It's not just about the student performance. You're going to see everything change. The morale will go up. The culture will go up. It's a very different world when we're all working together towards the same goal, and that's what this would do. It would put us on the same page, level playing field, all starting and growing and learning together, which I'm super excited about. It's definitely a big challenge, but <laughs> I'm definitely excited about it because we need this. Our district needs this. So, questions? I have a couple. <laughs> I thought um, you might. <laughs> um, so, why are we keeping MAP? The MAP assessment. Sorry, I saved my questions to the end. I didn't want yeah, to interrupt. No, that's fine. Um, honestly, I think what happened was we were piloting these two resources at the same time, and I think we wanted to give MAP a shot before we just pushed it away at the secondary level. It did not make sense to combine MAP with IXL for the elementary level, so we had to make a switch there. And I think the ultimate goal was to go I ready higher, but when we did this, we were like, you know what, let's see what happens with it because secondary is a whole different world and it may be a better fit for secondary. So it was more of a, we were piloting it at the same time. It seemed to be working very well in both levels. So the teachers were huge proponents of the map at the 6 through 10 level and elementary were huge proponents of iReady. So that's how we ended up with that decision. But trust me, as we go through this year, if that's not working, that will be fixed. I mean, that, we have to make sure that we're doing what's best for kids, but I think it could be best for kids if we're on IXL that offers that content that goes all the way up to 12th grade. Is it necessary to keep MAP if IXL is functioning the way we need it to? You know what, that's a really great question. Um, Okay, so there is an IXL screener. However, it isn't necessarily aligned directly to New York State standards. When you take the MAP test, which is directed to New York State standards, that path that students get, their individual personal plan, the New York or the NW MAP produces that plan for them. So while we can do a lot of things with IXL, and we can do a diagnostic with IXL, the personal plan that's directly related to New York State standards and exactly what we need for next gen comes from MAP, talking to IXL. Okay, and this is more, I guess, um, a question. I don't know if you can answer it. I don't know if you can speak for either. everyone on this one, but um, at the secondary level, those individualized plans, mm -hmm. are we really using them? So that's the one thing we've had a, a limited... <laughs> We've had a limited number of us that are actually piloting this program. However, as soon as that became available, Heather Mundy is the ELA lab teacher on the west side of town. Heather and I spent countless hours creating a spreadsheet that had all of the links from IXL that, was, that were directly aligned to what the students needed from MAP. 
And then I Excel said, guess what? We have a new plan for you. And they gave us the New York State personal plan. So it was huge for kids to be able to go and look at that plan. And I was in a couple of AIS classes, and the students that really struggled really loved having their own plan. They were finding that they could be successful. I have a student who comes to see me on a regular basis. She's in a self-contained math class, and I have her certificates that IXL produces all over my classroom. She will come to see me when she's not coming in because she's getting success on her plan. So yeah, they're using it, and it's huge for them to be able to have success at the level they're at to put them to the next level. Thanks. You're welcome. My next question was, is MAP, re I know that a screening tool is required at the elementary level. Is, since we're using MAP as a screening tool at the secondary level, is it required at the secondary level? I don't know the answer to that question, to be honest with you. Um, what I do know is every school I have ever been in does K through 8. K through 8 for sure. Um, the only two schools I know of that have done screeners at the 9 through 12 level are North Tonawanda and Brockport. Um, I did a little bit of research on that, and they are the only two who seem to do it. Brockport does use the NWEA screener, the MAP screener, so um, we could certainly reach out to them and talk to them and see you know, what their experiences have been. I don't know what North Tonawanda, North Tonawanda uses. I think that we at the high school level over recent years were yearning for something to assess our students because at the high school level what is really an entrance criteria to academic intervention services is that regents assessment. Right. So we don't have the regents assessment in grades 9 and 10 in ELA but we had kids who had reading deficits coming in. They were used to MAP, they had taken it over the years so it was something that was familiar to them. Once we trained our teachers and they utilized that with our grade 9 and 10 students in ELA specifically, they loved it because they now had a tool to give them uh, a reading of where their kids were in ability level in the classroom. So we did ninth grade first, and then we phased in 10th grade. We're holding right now on 11th grade because we want to take one more year to take a look to make sure that this is viable in the classroom at the high school level. But it has been so far a good tool to have for our students because previously we didn't have any type of screener at the high school level. We have recently added algebra as well, so all students in high school who take algebra will get the math map to help kind of diagnose where their areas are that they need focus and attention. So are we using this as a screener for AIS services? It is one of multiple measures that we're using for AIS at the high school. At the high school level. Okay. Thanks for answering sure. those questions. I appreciate it. Um, the next question that I have jumps into benchmark. Um, can we ensure that all benchmark resources will be in place by September? Because I know that this can be an issue. Yeah, so <laughs> I'm glad you asked that question because that was one of my main concerns. And so I reached out to the company and I said, listen, I need to know what you can guarantee me. Yeah. And they are guaranteeing that they will have the materials delivered the week of June 19th. Oh, okay. Because I said that I have a summer plan. Yeah. I was like, you're going to ruin my summer plan if I don't have those materials. So they, um, and they actually put it in writing in a letter to us that they would have the materials here for June 19th. I'm so yes, you have teachers. other summer plans too, by the way, Carol. Just, what? I'm hoping you have other summer plans too, by the way. <laughs> I'm hoping that too. <laughs> <laughs> and then just my final question was, is the cost of this program, is it an annual cost? No, it is not. So it's a three-year deal, and then at the end of the three years, if we want to renew, we would renew. The renewal would be significantly less because we've already got the books, we've already got all the teacher manuals, we've already, the only thing you would be renewing would be the digital subscription and the um, consumables, the little books that the kids are taking home with them. So that would be the only cost that you would be on the hook for, and you wouldn't be on the hook for it until three years. So right now we're on, we would be on a three-year plan if it goes through, um, and then at the end of the three years, we would renew just those smaller pieces. Thank you. Absolutely. Can I, can I piggyback off that question? Mm -hmm. how, how long do you expect to be going through this whole process again then and coming up with a whole new plan? Ten years? Five years? Nothing? Like, <laughs> realistically, like, when my younger kids were in your school, you had to step back from the PTA because you were doing the same thing. 
How many years ago was that? Seven, eight years ago? Nine years ago? What is the lifespan of this program? So we have in place this year, we developed the curriculum review cycle. So we have six phases. And so, you know, feasibly, you're looking at this on a regular and consistent basis. Each phase has its own assessment piece. So you're constantly revisiting and reviewing because there could be changes like new standards that come our way. Or we could have uh, students who are not performing as we would like them to. And so it's a question of, are the materials and the resources that we are using meeting the needs of our students in the district? And so really what that cycle helps us to do is keep our finger on the pulse, keep the conversation going, and assessing whether the needs are still being met. Are our children performing as desired? Is the curriculum being implemented as designed? And so that really keeps that conversation going so vertically. A little bit of a risk with the initial investment, but I mean, it seems like, in my opinion, I think it. anything less than that, um, to, to be quite honest, it's not really um, speaking to the investment of time our teachers have put into this overall process along with Carol and all yeah. of the administrators from the buildings that have been involved because you really need to have at least a good two to three years in a process to vet that it's actually working and or not. So okay. I think three years is a good place to start. Anything beyond that might be excessive. Um, so really, I think it's a nice kind of happy medium. But if this company does a good job like they should, they would be able to adapt and adjust as needed also if yes. they want to stay with us. Yes, okay. yes, okay. absolutely. Oh, yeah, and I've already called them and said a few things that I want different, and they've already done it. Okay. So they're very agreeable to working with you. Um, the PD has been exceptional. I watched several videos, and the woman who did our presentation, she's one of their <coughs> Questions. Right, I just want to, I don't hold a grudge with you stepping back from the BPA. <laughs> I don't know how excited you were to be working on a new program, and there I, you are again. I was, but because what we had when I first started as HR. I've also had okay. three of your children, so I'm trying to remember which child it was. <laughs> um, but yes, yeah, so it was a little different at the time. The process to look into this was different at the time. Okay. Um, we would go in on Saturdays. We, at the, we also only looked at three programs. They were all very similar. Uh, this was part of their process as well. Okay. They were all very similar. Um, and at the time, what we had was ancient. So everything looked very new, very fresh. <laughs> it looked <laughs> shiny and great and wonderful. Um, and but now, what we've also learned throughout the years has changed for us as well. Um, different practices for reading has changed. And even when we got that program, I do believe at that time as well, one of the things that was missing was that was classroom teaching. But you did not have that extra support for your ENL, for your special ed, um, also for um, just even students that were at the higher level. It was pretty basic. Um, the term was called basal because it's, it isn't basic. It was very basic. Everybody was the same story. There was a little room for differentiation, but not much. Um, this is very different. There's a lot of room for differentiation, high, medium, low. Um, and with that digital access, the parents will see. So, just so I understand, you'd be next year, I ready is new for the majority of people. Map is continued, but not at the elementary level, correct? Not at the elementary level. Right. Okay. Intervention block would be new, a new, and on an addition to that, a new reading series. You Come got it. All at once. We're ripping that bandy off. Just I don't. I don't need it. I, I got it. I understand it. I'm just saying that that's a whole lot of new. It is. It is. But I think it's a, some pieces that will help us plan for those intervention blocks a little bit better. I think what we heard two minutes about already is that it was so intuitive and so user friendly, like teachers kind of had it like, pretty quickly, and that it was similar to math and administration pieces, but much easier to adapt to learn. So but they were willing to. Yes, after four minutes, we were able to go ahead and, and um, work with the children with it and get started on it right away. It is very user-friendly for the kids and for the teachers. There's only a few little clips. 
And the one other thing that I will say to that is when we had the ELA curriculum review team, I did throw out the idea of staggering how we rolled out some of these pieces, and the general consensus among the team was, don't do that. Just, just do it. We're just going to do it, and we're going to do it together, and we're going to grow it together. Don't piecemeal, like, let's start with this part of the program, and then add this part on, and add the, they were like, just do it. So that was really more coming from the teachers saying, we're ready, we're hungry, we want this. Let's just do it. There's an old adage that you shouldn't shop when you're hungry. <laughs> that is so true. That is so true. Anything else from anybody? Thank you for presenting. I know we all know how much work has gone into yeah, this process. Sure. And, um, you know, it, it sounds like it's been a very inclusive process. And um, I'm glad that there, w there was a consensus formed among everyone. So You and me both. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So thank you, and thank you to everyone who presented tonight. Thank you for taking the time to be here. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. All right, folks. Molly's just stalling until Liz gets back. She's not coming back no matter what. She's okay. Not <laughs> All right. So I believe, um, correct me if I'm wrong, we are on um, item 12 of our agenda, personnel. Thank you, Matt. Okay. So um, we're looking at 12A, create classified positions. Um, can I have a motion to approve the creation of these new classified positions? I would like to make that gladly motion. make a motion. Okay, thanks. Oh, How about a second? Because oh, I get to jump in there. Okay, I have to keep track of this. So can you give me a second? Sure. Okay, who made the motion? Ed? Good. Sure. And then I had Vince seconding? I'll second. Thanks. We got you next. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, is there any board discussion? All right. Maybe. Um, um, can I ask Mr. Bystrick to just briefly provide an update to the community on the reason of these positions sure. being created? Thank you. Sure. So the grounds worker position, we actually had one of our grounds workers that is now in the transportation department, so we had to backfill. Uh, basically, we've been. We'll hire bus drivers whenever we can, so that's a really good thing. We're in a good situation there. Um, the seasonal positions there, so you've got your laborers. Uh, that Actually, that was a part of a plan by uh, Mick Barr, who is our new executive housekeeper. Basically, we're just trying to ensure that we have enough work to get done, uh, workers to get our work done over the summer. So these are just seasonal positions. Uh, it's something new we're trying this year. That uh, I think it's a great idea. Uh, but, you know, a lot of times people are trying to take their vacations in the summer and stuff. So you've got people in these labor positions uh, have a little more flexibility in terms of the, the kind of work they're able to do beyond the uh, cleaner. So, uh, and then you've got your uh, summer bus washers and your uh, bus washer crew chiefs as well. So this was something that we used to, we always did during the summertime. You want to get the buses cleaned up and, and shaped up and everything. And so this is something that, and sometimes our students actually end up picking up these positions as well. So. Um, but it just provides some opportunity also. We may have some of our 10-month uh, employees as well that want to pick up this work too. So that's what they come down to. All right. Thanks, Mr. Bystrack. So they're, okay. uh, oh. I'm sorry. The, they're part-time part and they're seasonal. So yes. they end at the end of summer. Correct. But these people would um, have a foot in the door then for positions we so would need. Many of, many of the people I anticipate that may, may jump into this may also be people that work for us during the school year as oh, well. Perfect. In oh, perfect. Oh, great. Cases. Great. So that's, it, awesome. That was one of the benefits to this. Okay. All right, folks, let's, um, let's take a vote. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Okay, so I heard four ayes. Aye. You heard five ayes. <laughs> okay. Sarah, passes, you want to jump in there? <laughs> passes 5 0. Okay. I don't know. I mean, You're supposed to. Okay. All right, so um, now we're moving on to new business. Um, 13A, I believe. Okay. Um, this is a transportation policy. I'll give you a second just to get there. Okay, can I have a motion for 13A? I'll make the motion. Thanks. And a second? Jody? Okay, thanks. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Thank you. Any opposed? Okay, passes 5 0.
Okay, so now we're on to 13b. Oh, this is going to take, okay. Um, can I have, okay, so this is, um, I'm looking for a motion to approve 13b through 13p. I'll make that motion. Motion made by Ed. Can I have a second? I'll second. Second comes from Vince. I'll, oh, I have to ask. Any discussions? I, I think it's fantastic that we're um, taking care of the fingerprinting fees for our CISA workers. So do uh, I. I yeah. think we can do everything and anything we can to attract those folks into those positions. They're super important. And uh, hopefully this helps a little bit. Agreed. Uh, okay. Comment in there. I appreciate our board leadership and um, Nicole and everyone, um, administrators, whoever getting that July 5th meeting set for us. I know it was a pain. Um, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. And I also thought I saw in here, maybe not, donations. Yes. I always like to just uh, appreciate the donations. I mean, what great thing when the community, people from the community or businesses are sending money in. Um, looks like WISTA, the support reading Walt Rover, the West Seneca Band Boosters. Um, to be used towards prop purchases. I mean, that's amazing. And then Suntex International um, to West Elementary for competing and winning a New York State Department of Ed sponsored yeah. math competition. That's How awesome. cool is that? It's awesome. Yep. So that's a nice to see funds coming in, not from taxpayer pockets. <laughs> All right, Ed, thank you. Okay, so can we um, can we vote then? Can um, Can I get a... A vote. All Aye. those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Passes 5 0. Just give me a second, guys. Okay. So now we're moving on to um, Q instructional software. I ready? Okay. Can I have a motion for 13 Q? Make a motion for the GQ to approve. The yes, thanks. Second? This is on Q? Thank you. Yes, this is on I ready. Yeah. Okay, we got Jan with a second. Okay, any discussion? Pardon? Very, 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 <laughs> very, no, for real, very thorough. I really, very thorough. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I don't think we, hopefully we don't need any more discussion. Okay. Okay, so let's vote. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Okay, passes 5 0. Thank you. Okay, now we're looking at our instructional software, um, IXL. Can I have a motion for 13R? I'll to approve 13R. I'll make a motion to approve. Thank you. I'll second. Thanks, Jody. Any discussion? Okay. All those in favor? Aye. All Aye. those opposed? Okay. Passes 5 0. Thank you. Okay. And now we're looking at um, S. Um, it's the benchmark education contract. Yeah. I'd like to make a motion to table us. Okay. So this is when I'm going to need a little bit of help, Nicole. To table something, does there have to be um, a second? There needs to be a second. No. Does there need to be? I know that there would need to be a second, but does there have to be board majority vote on that? So do I have to? Yes, to table it. So would it be a roll call vote then? Okay. I'm sorry. Can you repeat that? Okay. Okay. Um, so there's been a motion um, by Mr. Vince Vanderlip to table um, this contract. So I'm looking for a vote to table the contract. Okay. Um, but I need a second first. Okay. So it's let me just get. We go into the second. Can we go to the discussion no, and hear his? Why? We need to second to move. We have to discussion. second it first. Okay, so let me get um, let me get Vince down as a motion to table. 
making this tricky for me, Biz. This is a motion to table. And is there a second? I'll second to table the motion. If there's not enough people here to make a decision if we're not. Okay, so Jody's. So Jody is going to second the motion to table. Okay, so now we're going to vote on tabling it. Discussion. Okay, discussion first. Vince. Yeah, absolutely. I believe that we just heard a really um, ambitious uh, presentation. We've heard that we are we piloted two software um, tools that are going to help immensely with screening and with preparing our students and teach. That's going to be put on teachers next year. We've also heard that there's going to be a new um, intervention law. I think that the implementation of benchmark at this point in time is overload. I believe that it's overly ambitious and I need more I need more of a conversation to understand exactly how this is going to be adopted and implemented across the district. And quite frankly, the price tag scares me. So yeah. Okay. Um, my question would be what so if we table it, if we table the next meeting, give us opportunity to what, learn more about it, talk about it, that sort of thing. Yeah, I think right. that there needs um, to be some conversation about we're, we're offering, so the ARO hours and all the professional development that's going to go into iReady and IXL, and then on top of that, we're going to have a completely new reading series that is quite complex, that we heard, it's very complex, it's very involved, and that that's all going to happen next year, and it's all going to work out just fine. Okay. So. Wait, how does this... What, I mean, what, what would uh, what would more board? What, what, if it was tabled to the next meeting, where does that does that where does that how does that change things? I mean, just it pushes us back a month, and I guess I just want to know specifically what. I mean, I thought there was pretty thorough conversation and depth plan laid out, so I just would want to know from the board or from you, Vince, just what specifically would give you more comfort. I guess um, the intervention blocks it sounds like are in place. Well, there's already also the funding yeah. part, right? So. When Benchmark was originally presented to us as an option, it was going to be aidable. Mm -hmm. It's no longer aidable. At that time when we had a conversation, we also talked about there being coaches hired to help with the implementation. That no longer on the table because of the expense of this product. Um, I'm concerned that this, along with everything else that's going on, with the ELA, the, the transition, it's going to be too much and a year is not going to be nearly as productive as it was. We would have more time to look at, as we are looking at other funding sources and possibilities with COSERS and making this more aidable and more affordable for the district. So, yeah, there's, there's, more, there's more questions than answers right now for me that aren't going to be answered right here, right at this moment. That's why I'd rather than vote against it, I would rather table it and get to those facts. I'm not, I'm not sure if during discussion we can still ask a question to, to, to Mrs. Absolutely. Bush. Yeah. Okay, so, um, so. What's if, the rush? Well, by if, the it, way? if it What's does get, ta okay, if it does get tabled, thank you. If it does get tabled, okay, and, um, and it's decided that we are indeed going to implement it um, or, you know, adopt it. Um, how, how far does that set you back as far as implementation goes and the logistics of it? Because I did see your calendar of implementation. I saw that plan laid out. Um, so...
Okay. Does any? You know what I would say to that? Those are the people that should be piloting this program. We piloted iReady. We piloted IXL. But we're just going to, we've vetted this. We looked at seven different, the group looked at seven different products. Got it down to two. Chose one in the course of a year. And that's vetting this. So my concern is, why not pilot it? Why is this not being piloted? Why is it being bought right out of the gate, full implementation while we're implementing other things? It just. And we did talk about pilot. It was the committee decided against it. Yeah. Um, Jeff, you have a question? Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so just to be clear. Oh, go ahead. Can we even move forward without Jeff? I don't think we can move forward. Yeah. Well, well we, have a, we have board majority. We have a majority here. We can well, if we all voted yes, yes to table it. Yeah, if we voted yes. Yes. But um, if we vote no to table it, then we have to vote on the item. And it would... Without guy. Jan and without Liz. Right. And Diane. <sighs> you can't... It, um, you need unanimous of the people here. You have to, it's, it's about the whole board. So it's basically there's seven board members, so four people would have to say uh, yes to it in order for it to pass right now. Best option is to table it. I, and I, I don't even want to go here, but I believe, it, I believe it's a postponed, not a table, right? Tabling takes it off the agenda, postponing it, postpones it to the next meeting. Or am I completely wrong on that? No, no. I mean, the table, you just bring it back, you know, when you're ready to bring it back again. If We if would have to bring it back to put it on the agenda, though, right? Yes. Okay. We make a motion to table it and put it on the next agenda? Is no, well, we, I think the, mo the motion right now is to table. There's a first and a second. We're in discussion. The next thing has to be a vote. If I'm... Yeah. So I guess that's the first decision is to vote to table it or... Move well, we would have to vote because the motion to table is on the floor. Right. Right. Okay. So, um, so let's let's do that. Okay. Um, okay. So I have a motion to table made by Vince. I have a second um, motion to table made by Jody. So now um, I'm looking for a vote to table. So all in favor? Aye. Aye. So you're against. Yeah. You're against the tabling. Okay. So then we can't. So then the table doesn't pass. Correct. Okay, Three to one. Three. Yeah. Is Jan no longer with us? Yeah. Jan's no longer with us. Jan left like thirty seconds before this happened. Oh. Okay. So, is it, uh, her proxy? so it's three to one. So, it's, so now we have to go and vote on it, right? Individually, we have to vote. So you have to make a motion to go because it's already done. So now we have to vote on it. So all four of us have to. Approve it. Okay. Okay, so now, okay, so now I'm looking for a vote to um, approve the contract for benchmark education services. Okay, so I need a motion. <laughs> I need a motion to approve. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I totally respect what Vince is saying. I, I would like to just move forward with it. I know it's probably not going to happen. Um, but I will make a motion to approve 13S. I'm actually going to second Ed's motion now after hearing Vince's reasoning. Okay, so Ed makes the motion. Jody seconds the motion. Okay, so all in favor. Well, discussion. Or discussion. Again, I, I want to reiterate, because I do totally understand what you're saying. <laughs> um, the next question I would have is, if, if it was next month, you're looking to have it wait for another whole year, not a month, correct? Correct. You want to pilot it? I want to pilot it, yes. Okay. Yeah. And how, how does that change things? Did uh, Carol? Carol, how does that change things if we were piloting it? Or it's not our decision to pilot it, right? Oh, Carol? It's, is, is it, it's not our decision to pilot, it's our decision to say that's what we would like to happen, or... Okay, is there any more discussion? Okay, so now um, a motion has been made to approve the contract. Motion was made by Ed. A second was made by Jody. So now we're going to a vo we're going to a vote. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Okay. So, what does that mean, Nicole? Yeah. Failed. Okay. 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 So, um, don't need a vote on informational documents, correct? No. Okay, um, so we're approaching um, 15 on our agenda board discussion. Um, at this time, I'd like to, like to open the floor to any board member who would like to have public discussion. Um, please wait to be recognized by myself before speaking, and do not interrupt or talk over other board members who have the floor. Thank you. Does anybody have any discussion? This is just general discussion. Yeah, yeah no, I think we we're good. Okay, so now we're at um, adjournment. At this time, I'd like to ask for a motion to adjourn the meeting. I'll make the motion. Motion made by Jody. And a second. A second. All in favor? A, did somebody second? I'm sorry. Thank Oops. you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Pose. Okay. Meeting closes. Are we okay? Yep. Did I? Okay. Great job, Alice. Right. Thanks. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.